the police running up the stairs this way, to the police car this way. And then he went, where's the gun? They sort of kind of kidnapped him. Yes. <laughs> and he used to keep a tally of everyone he'd knocked out. Like, I've never done that. No, <laughs> Jesus. Too many. Just <laughs> and he went, hang on a minute. He went, he went to no, strip search. Okay. Dave, Dave Courtney. He's just driving straight towards this wall. And I'm thinking, turn, turn. <laughs> Turn. Dave's never done anything really bad to me. He's, he's done a few naughty little annoying things. I might tell you about him in a minute. But <laughs> someone's paid five grand to have you shot dead. All of a sudden, you're in this you're in this world that yeah. you've only read about. All these riot squads got out. They've got shields and batons. There's like eight, ten of them. So Operation Mayflower was a massive thing. It involved 120 police officers. Over six months surveillance. They spent over a million pounds on surveillance. I was getting followed around. Like my phone was getting, getting tapped. I was a drug importer, gun runner, a hitman, an enforcer, a debt collector. Well, some of it's true. Um, <laughs> all of a sudden, I got, I got just cut off by all these other police cars. I've got five of them. I've got dog vans and no. vans, police cars. I find it fascinating you've never been banged up. Just how do I? Marcus, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. Wow, we've never had someone come back on a part three by the demand from everyone out there. They're like, get Marcus Redwood back on for part three. It's been wicked. Yeah. It's been really wicked. It's been uh, been fun, hasn't it? Yeah, very much. Yeah. Let's, um, let's get the ball rolling here. Let's roll all the way back. I actually want to go back to your early days when you first started The Doors down in Margate. Mm. Yeah. It's a while back for you, but I want to roll back into your, your mind there. What was it actually like on The Doors back then? Um, it was well for a young doorman. It was quite scary actually to start with. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't an easy place to work, especially in the summer. I mean, vastly different from you know the winter to the summer. There was a lot of difference. Um, but uh, yeah, it was. I mean, back then, remember what you got to look at is there was no there was no door licenses. Mm. There was actually no uniforms at all. There was no radios. There was no metal detectors. <laughs> Basically, what they did. I mean, the, the old school way of doing it was you know the, the local sort of hard man got yeah. a job on a door. I mean, I, I mentioned him before. The name that springs to my mind from them days is a guy called Johnny Andrews um, because he was working a, uh, a pub and a nightclub on his own. He was the only guy there. Had no backup, nothing at all. No radio, no point having radios on his own. But but he was just as tough as old boots and no one messed with him. I mean, and the ones that did regretted it because he'd find them the next day, go knock on the door. You know, so even if you could beat him in numbers, he would go and individually pick you out one by one. So... His reputation, just people just didn't bother. Mm. But but when I got when I started on the doors, I was like, I said I'd, I'd been doing a little bit of door work in a funny little pub in Broadstairs. Um, but when I started on the doors in Margate, I would have been about eighteen, nineteen, um, and I was definitely like a new kid on the block. You know, I'd I'd started training at the gym after a bike accident, so I'd started putting a bit of weight on. I've got friends with the doorman who I was training in there, and they invited me up to um, one of the bars was called Green's Wine Bar. And I remember I used to basically be like a fill-in doorman at first, you know, because if it was a bank holiday, they'd normally up the numbers by one, you know. So mm -hmm. there was like, say, two or three doormen. They'd put an extra one on for the bank holiday because of the extra coach parties and visitors from out of town. And one that springs to mind particularly, um, I was working in Greens this particular weekend. It was a bank holiday. And we had a head doorman there who was an absolute, is the epitome of a um, bully boy doorman. He was a big, capable guy. He was a black belt karate, you know, he was a big, tough lad, but he just wanted to fight everybody, yeah? And unfortunately, one of the other guys with him was also of the same mentality. So you had two out of three doormen there. There was another, Big Lloyd, my other mate. Yeah. Big Lloyd was there as well, but he was actually, you know, a, a more fair and, and mm. sort of understanding guy. So you've got, you've got two, two guys there who are real handfuls and real nasty. Mm. But anyway, so Mickey, one of them, he's turned around to me and he said, right, he said, bank holiday weekend coming up. I want everyone to bring a tool. So I'm, like, I'm 19, I think. Okay. So bank holiday weekend, I turn up with a 12 gauge shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> and he went, he went, what the fuck is that? I said, you said bring a tool. So <laughs> you said bring a tool. He said, I'm in a knuckle duster or a bat. He said, idiot. He said, he said, well, you bought it now. He said, so let's let's put it in that cupboard under the stairs. So there was a, you come in the front door, there was like a cupboard on your left. So uh, we put it in there. We just stood it in there and shut the door. And the night carried on. It was bank holiday. I can't remember if it was a Friday or Saturday. It was bank holiday weekend anyway. And we did have some coach parties in from Barnet, I believe, or somewhere like that. And they all kicked off. So near the end of the night, near like 11 or 11.30, we had this big kickoff with these guys. And like I said, there's three or four of us to get them out. And we, we had a proper, proper old tear up with them. We, but you had to go down about two flights of stairs. So you're literally, you're trying to remove them and you're trying to fight them on the stairs and everything. We got them out. got into this big car park outside and... Um, 
and they they weren't happy. They wanted to come back and continue the fight, sort of thing. And anyway, so <laughs> one I remember one of the doormen, he's got his bat out, he's got his gum shield in, you know, and he's actually trying to talk to him. He's going, bluh, 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 and they couldn't understand what he was on about, you know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, so then I just turned, I just I pulled the gun out, and I just, I, I, and, I, and I, so I'm out, I've, I've, I've shot out the door with this loaded gun because they're all kicking off with the doormen, and then they they retreated, you know, hastily, and and I sort of chased them down the car park a little way. But I didn't. I didn't shoot anybody. Mm. You know, it was. It wasn't the idea. The idea was to scare the shit out of them, yeah. and it actually worked pretty good. But what happened was, I've got like a couple of hundred meters away from where I'm supposed to be, and I've got. Um, so I'm there with a loaded gun in the middle of a car park, right? And then all of a sudden, I see blue lights coming, oh, no. and I'm thinking, shit. And I just froze. I just honestly, I'm like, ah, I'm going to get nicked, right? And then all of a sudden, this this white Peugeot 405 pulls up right in front of me with the back window open. And it was a big black guy I used to train in the gym called Larry, Larry Lord. I give him a thank you, Larry, because yeah. my life would have gone in a completely different direction. Mm -hmm. He went, sling it in the back. So, so I've, I've thrown the gun through the open window. It's bounced onto the back seat. And he's just driven straight off out of this. There's only one entrance into this car park. And as he's driving out, the police cars with the blue lights are coming in. So, and they've literally surrounded me. There's police running up the stairs this way, there's a police car this way. And I'm like, and then he went, where's the gun? And I went, gun <laughs> it's in the car going off down the seafront oh mate i mean when i think about it it was such a stupid thing to do all right it really was but in my defense i was young and i was trying to impress the older yeah. doorman you know yeah, yeah, yeah. um which he did <laughs> is larry still about today larry i think last time i spoke to him he was working in london as a croupier was he yeah oh, but he's yeah. a lovely lovely he was a great big guy I mean, he was big enough to be a doorman but he wasn't a doorman mm. he was a local taxi driver but he trained in the same gym as all of us guys mm. But yeah, if he hadn't have been there that night, uh, my whole life would have taken a different mm. a different direction, shall we say. And what about gym life for you? You mentioned gym. You were getting in that early doors, 18, 19. Obviously training with a load of lumps. Mm -hmm. I'd imagine a load of the lumps were all on the gear. Yeah. When were you introduced to that world? Well, I was in almost immediately. I mean, I literally, the, the gym I chose to train at, there wasn't, in them days, there wasn't all these, you know, Bannertines and mm. this and that. It was, it, was, it was a little hardcore gym down the back street. Mm. You know, it was a sort of spit and sawdust place. And it was being run by a guy called Graham Olive, who was a monster. I mean, he was like 20 stone of just sheer muscle. He was also a black belt. He was one of the nasty doormen. Was he? He, he, he? he just loved breaking people. Mm. I mean, this this guy actually won the gold medal. He punched through six one-inch boards. You know, I mean, that's that takes some doing. Mm. If he hit you in the jaw, you didn't have a jaw. Yeah. You know, he did a reverse spinning kick on a guy one night and broke his pelvis. Pelvis, Jesus Broke his pelvis, Christ. and then as the guy dropped down, he jumped on top of him and he punched both his cheekbones off of his face. Oh, yeah. He was blind for two months, the guy. Mm. I mean, he, he, he just destroyed anything he hit. Mm. He, was, uh, he had too much power and too much ability, but he had a real nasty, you know, nasty head on his shoulders. Yeah. So I, I worked with those people for the first few years and they basically just showed me how not yeah. to be a doorman. So everything I learned from them was like, don't do that, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, as, it's quite sad, but both of those guys, um, I mean, we always say, you know, you, you reap what you sow. Mm. Both of those guys ended up dead at an early age. I think don't think they made it to 30. But they don't. Um, well, one of them, Graham uh, tried to kill himself. Um, the first attempt, he was so solid, this guy. His first attempt, he threw himself out of a third-story window mm. and just hit the floor. Got back up, dusted himself off, and went up and had another go. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> Serious. Jesus. Right? And the landlady lived in the ground floor <laughs> flat, and she just kept seeing this, <laughs> right? And he's like, mm. <laughs> Anyway, the police, 20 police turned up to arrest him. Jesus. And, and it took 20 police to arrest him. He yeah. broke one of their arms, and he battered them, and they finally got him in there. Um, and but as soon as he was released, he went back out and he took a big overdose of pills, okay. drank a bottle of vodka, and bosh, gone. Yeah. Um, but um, the other one, Mickey, what was Mickey's surname? Oh, uh, uh, Mickey, da Mick Mickey Davy. Okay. Yeah, Mick Davy or Metal Mickey, they used to call yeah. him. He was he was nasty. He, he he used to like using a bat on people. He didn't need a bat because he was really good with his hands yeah. and his feet. But he had this. Um, yeah, I, I see him. I pulled him off a guy one night because he we chased this guy up the high street. And um, it's, this is a, another bit of a funny story because I actually got to meet this guy like some 20 years later. So I was a young doorman. We, we finished work at this wine bar and we were leaving there to go to a nightclub where we were going to continue to work. But these, 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 in the summer, then you used to have groups of guys in coach parties wandering around the streets. So some guys run out and kicked his car. And he just jumped. He, we pulled the car over. We all jumped out. We chased this guy up the high street. And this guy wishes he had kicked the car now, mm. you know what I mean? But he ran, because he didn't know the area, this guy ran down like a little dead-end alley. 
and now Mickey's got him trapped, and Mickey's got a bat on him. Oh my! And so there's you know there's three of us big lumps walking yeah. down this alley towards this guy, and I'm thinking I know Mick's gonna hit you know gonna hurt him, yeah. but I didn't, hopefully not too bad. Yeah. But he, anyway. He, the guy, he swings the bat, the guy puts his arm up and he smashes his arm with the bat, breaks his arm, but then he continues. Smashes him over the head, knocks the geezer out, still continues, still oh. continues. I mean, he's going to cave his head in. Yeah. And I literally, I grabbed hold of him, I grabbed hold of him and I pulled him off as hard as I could, um, you know, trying to talk some sense into him. But I, I pulled him off. Look, he's, he's, he's done, yeah. you know. And we dragged him off. And I, and I really thought the guy was going to die. Um, and I, like I said, I was only probably, probably 19 then, mm. so I was, I was shit myself. You know, but they were like twenty. They were probably about twenty five, twenty six. So that yeah. that that age gap then, they're, they're much more senior to you. You know, but I managed to pull him off anyway. And it wasn't till it wasn't till later in life when I went to Thailand when I first started going to Thailand, and I was in this bar uh, called the Dogs Bollocks, right? <laughs> uh, in this little What's this, tiny, Pattaya? It's, yeah, in Pattaya, yeah. and it's a, and it, it's a very well known bar. So loads of people I mentioned this, the Dogs Bollocks. Yeah. Anyway, and so I'm in there, and, I'm in a, and it wasn't a modern sort of bar I go to. It's like a little you know, football crowd and all that, and a little thuggy sort of bar. But anyway, I said, I've got to chat this guy, and he goes, where are you from? I said, England. He goes, yeah, where are you from in England? I said, oh, Margate. Oh, Margate. Oh, I got the shit kicked out of me in Margate, right? Anyway, so he starts talking about it. He said, yeah, he's chasing me up this alleyway and with a bat and a, oh, no. I said, like, I said, well, did you kick his car? He goes, yeah. And I said, <laughs> we got talking. He goes, well, yeah. I said, I was there. I said, I, put, I said, he broke your arm with the first swing of the yeah. bat. He went, yeah. He goes, then I got knocked out. He said, I had really, I had, you know, bad, broken, a fractured skull, blah, blah. I said, mate, I said, he would have killed you. I said, I pulled him off of you. Mm. You know, it was proper bizarre. Oh, meeting the guy 20 years later mm. that I thought, I thought mm. he'd been killed. Or we thought, we all thought he'd got permanent brain damage or something like that. That's what we were told. But obviously. Just because he kicked his car? Yeah. Yeah. The mentality of that is. Oh, listen, they've done worse than that. Yeah. I've actually, I've, I've been in a bar with him one day. And it's a really busy bar in the screens. And it's a long, very long sort of uh, narrow bar. And there was no real trouble this night. Nice crowd in, no trouble. So he's picked up a pint off the top like that and he's thrown it over his head behind him so as it's got like 10 or 12 people. It's, it's gone over everyone at the bar. Now they're all they're all looking for who threw the drink and not expecting it to be the doorman. Yeah. So they're all starting on each other. He just purposely caused a problem in the bar just so he could throw someone out and knock them out. Oh. And he used to keep a tally of everyone he'd knocked out. You know, I mean, I've never done that. No, Jesus. <laughs> Too many. <laughs> so what was it like then, the mentality of this, right? You're 18, 19, you're seeing this all around you. Hmm. Are you thinking this is, like a minute ago you said it's not the way to act, but are you were you impressed by it or did you get scared by the actual no, the was, brutality of what they were doing? The brutality of it was, yeah, I mean, look, if, if, if someone deserves a smack, yeah. I'm all for giving them a smack. Yeah. I really am. I'm not, I'm, you know, but, but when, when a guy's done either a minor thing mm -hmm. or he's you know he's a bit too drunk I mean, let's face it what, what when i started working with some other dorm and i worked with this other guy called elwin and he said to me look he said we've got 350 people that can get in this club this little club we was working mm -hmm. he said 365 days in the year mm -hmm. he said everyone has a bad day once a year he said so our job is to just deal with that as best we can so that guy might be a really nice guy for most of the year maybe he's had a row with his wife maybe he's just got too much to drink tonight yeah. but he's an, if he's going to be an asshole, which is out of his character don't hurt him for it. Just, yeah. just remove him. Calm him. Try and calm him down. Try and put him outside. He'll probably come back and shake your hand next week. Mm. He said. He said. I've made a lot of my friends this way, and he was right. And that's. And his. Luckily, his influence was what I listened to. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I took more. And I mean, let's say Johnny Andrews, the, the other guy I mentioned. Johnny Andrews was a really, really tough guy, but he was never a bully. Yeah. He didn't. He didn't smack anyone who didn't need a smack. You know. Um. He didn't pick on people, and it was the same. So that's what I sort of. That's what I took away from this. I mean, I was, <laughs> I'll tell you another one. I was in Greens one night and, uh, and I, I was, like I said, the young dormer, so eyes were on me to impress, you know. Sometimes they put me into a situation, you go deal with that, mm. just to see what I would do. Yeah. So one night, one day in Greens, I've gone up to this guy and he was he was being an asshole, big guy. And um, he basically told me to do one, you know. I mm. said, look, mate, calm down, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, fuck off, you know, you're a kid, you know. <laughs> and it's very hard when you're a young dormer trying to talk to a man who's, you know, maybe yeah. 35, something like that. They don't like being told off by a teenager. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so in the end, he's gone for me. So I've actually ginned him, knocked him out. But before he could even fall, I've like, knocked him out and grabbed him. And I've thrown him over my shoulder. And I thought, right, I've got this unconscious, <laughs> I've got this great big unconscious guy over my shoulder. And I'm thinking, shit, well, where's the exit? So I'm I'm heading towards the fire exit out the back. So I haven't got to drag this person all the way through. The, it's not doesn't look good, you know, with yeah. an unconscious bloke over your shoulder. Yeah. And, and I'm walking towards the fire exit, but I'm, and it's moving like this. And what the hell is going on be behind me? And that's Mickey walking along behind me, hitting the guy. No. Like he's a punch bag. And I'm trying to just carry him out, you know? 
He doesn't need any more. He's mm. unconscious. Mm. But yeah, so yeah, so sorry, what's the question? So, so I can't remember. I'm <laughs> just enjoying the story. So, be fair. so tell me when you like down in Margate, Kent. A lot of people travel all around the country, go down to Margate. Yeah. Was that more difficult for you to manage? Because you're not just like in an area where you know the crowds are coming in, who are the crowds are. You're getting random coach loads of football lads, mm. stag dudes, the lot all piling down there. I was mean, that I, harder? It was, It was. yeah, the season, once the season started, you know, you had your work cut out. Yeah. It was really, really tough. Um, we used to have um, bars, we used to call them the Beano. So a Beano, you know, it's like a, a coach party. So on, a, on, a, on, on Saturdays, we would have as many as 70 coach parties come down. And in the 80s, um, that was when the football violence was at its height, you know. So these would pr primarily be from different parts of London. Mm. So you'd have, like a, you'd have an Arsenal coach come down. Mm. You'd have a load of headhunters come down. Mm. You'd have, and then when they got on the seafront, oh, shit, you yeah. know, this lot would meet this lot, and bam, mm. you're, not, you're not fighting two or three guys. or You've you got 100 people now yeah. fighting. You've got this coach part, and they're, you know, they're used to fighting because they go away to have football violence. Yeah. And they also, they're only in the town for one night. They mm. don't care if you borrow them from mm. a club. Mm. So the hardest bit, in the daytime, we used to let them in. We actually had a bar called Broncos, and it was made for the coach parties. So the only downside was, again, no radios, no uniforms, and um, only five staff, I think. So five doormen, but very, very good mm. doormen by you. <laughs> very, very good doormen. Um, and uh, we used to let in like five, six hundred people on the piss in coach parties. And their place was built. It was built out of lot. The furniture was built out of tree trunks. So you couldn't you couldn't pick a table up or roll a stool over because they were some a tree, <laughs> right? And if you if you actually used to try to run towards a bit of problem, you, if you hit one of them, you break your legs. Yeah. But in the middle of the place was this. Uh, the bar was made like a western wagon. So it was all done like a sort of cowboy style. And then at the end, there was a corral with a bucking bull in it. Mm. So the, the thing used to be like, you know, it's a pound to get in, yeah, you know, yeah, cheap yeah, booze, yeah. have a go on the ball, see how long you can stay on. You know, you yeah. give prizes, you give drinks yeah. prizes and stuff. So you get all these drunk, you know, coach party. You imagine it, can't you? Yeah. you know, whole coach party full of drunken idiots from, and they're down for the day and they're riding the bull, yeah. you know? But it was it was crazy. That would be open from midday till about, I think it was about four or five. But in the evening, in the evening time, we didn't want them in. And in the evening, all the coaches, it was a bylaw. It wasn't actual law, but it was a bylaw that said all the coaches had to be out of the town by 6 p.m. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So that was that was a bylaw. But but what used to happen was that nine times out of ten, some of the coaches adhered to it. Some of them, you know, they'd be gone. Mm. And it's, you think, oh, great. But there was always that few that would, like, tip the coach driver and went, don't go yet. A few more hours. Yeah, a few yeah. more hours. <laughs> you go, leave, leave the area, take your coach out to the Thanet Way and park out there, come back and get us at, like, midnight or two in the morning. Yeah. So then they then then they're stuck in the town mm. and they are now trying to get into the clubs, but now they've been on the pistol day, probably done a bit of this or a bit yeah, of that, you know. Yeah. They're probably charged up. So we used to have our, our little trick really was um, obviously when you when you're a local doorman, you get to know your local faces, mm. and I pretty much know everybody. So you see these strangers queuing up, and they think you know there's a big queue, it's a busy club. They think then there's no way you're going to know. We always go like, sorry, fellas, you know, no groups. So that, you get the obvious ones being a big group. Mm. Um, and then you get the ones that would be a little bit clever and they, they get hold of a local girl yeah. and they pretend they're boyfriend and mm. girlfriend, right? And they'd still get to the door and I go, oh, you, your missus, yeah, your girlfriend? Yeah, okay. Uh, what's his name, love? You know? <laughs> and then it goes a stage further. What birth sign are you? Yeah. Right? Or where's your postcode? Right? Well, when, you, when you ask a Londoner where his, what his postcode is, uh, he didn't think about that one. Yeah. So nine times out of ten, we'd be able to screen most of them out on the front door. But then you'd obviously you'd get the odd coach party that just didn't, it got turned away from two or three bars, and now they just want to have a big, big punch-up with you. So we did used to get that as well. Luckily, um, as the years went on, and I was sort of starting my door agency, a lot of the venues were links because they were my, my, my guys. Mm. So where we might have, say, I mean, Escape Nightclub had about 10 to 12 staff. Frank's Nightclub probably had as many as seven. Uh, Punch and Judy would have had like maybe four or five, mm. but we could all contact each other. Yeah. So on the odd occasion when we had a big kickoff with a big coach party, we could call the reinforcements in, mm. which they didn't expect that either. How would you explain to the listener here what actually <clears throat> Margate looks like in terms of okay. bars, restaurants, clubs, nightclubs? Are everyone just on the well, on the front? Is one big strip? It's, or? it's changed a lot. It's not the same anywhere near the same no. as it used to be. But there's and obviously the layout's the same. You come into when you first come into Margate, you come into Margate and it sort of opens up to this sort of bay. Yeah. So you've got a beautiful bay, a lovely beach, um, you've got a pier. And then all around that, all the way along that front, you used to, there's arcades 
arcades, amusements, um, a few little bars. Now it's gone more sort of a bit more trendy. Now it's a bit like there's some wine bars, there's some little restaurants. It's a bit nicer. There's no big nightclubs there at all now. Mm. Nothing. Well, nightclub, the whole nightclub world's dying. Gone. There's yeah. no there's no nightclubs in the whole area. Do you know just... before, you know in 2019, before <clears throat> the pandemic, there was 1,500 nightclubs in the UK. Yeah. There's yeah. now less than 700. Yeah. And they're going losing every oh. week. We're losing more and more. Because the, you just can't, well, th there's a lot of reasons for it. I mean, the two things that changed it years ago was when they like, first bought in the smoking ban. Smoking, yeah. Smoking ban changed it a, a huge amount. 24 hour license. But the 24 hour license, yeah. you see, it used to be pubs and clubs. Yeah. So, I mean, in our area, for instance, I know I'm, I'm getting the numbers wrong here, but let's say let's say there was only 300 pubs. There's probably 500 pubs. Mm. But let's say there's 300 pubs. And let's say that they're now not open, not shutting at 11, but they're shutting at 1. Yep. So <clears throat> if only 10 people stayed in each of those mm. pubs, that's thousands of people yep. that would have gone <clears throat> on to a nightclub yep. and filled it up. So they, <clears throat> when they did that, they totally ruined the nightclub industry. Mm. And to be honest, it was much easier to police. Yeah. In the old days... When all them little pubs had shut, so everyone gets mildly Everyone comes drunk. out at 10 o'clock, well, straight yeah. in the club. And, yeah. Yeah, I mean, everyone used to be out on a Friday and Saturday. Everyone mm. would be out at 8 or 9. Mm. You'd go in a pub, meet your pals. There was mm. no Facebook then. Mm. So it wasn't like, how are you doing? I'm yeah. here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was like, you go to the pub to meet people yeah. and talk to people. That's where you met birds. <laughs> but then but then everyone would ship out at 10, 10, 30 and exactly. go straight to the club. So you, you knew. You had to get in. Yeah. You yeah. had to get in there before the club got full up. Yeah. The club would literally, you know, you'd be, you'd be stuck in a queue for an hour outside and freezing your tits off in mm. the winter, you know? But. Um, but now, everyone sort of strolls out. I mean, people don't leave the house till midnight now. Yeah. They tank up at home, come yeah. out at midnight, you know, and, and you, just, you just don't have the volume of people. I and think we, I think when we talk about the culture in England, everyone talks about theatres and all that. The culture in England is nightclubs. Yeah. That's a culture of ours that we're losing well, very was. quickly. I mean, I feel, I, I, you know, it's really bad that, I mean, you can still go to like a big city and you've still got enough people to support it. Yeah. You know, I mean, like in London, you've got it. But even that has changed. Yeah. It's not the quality that it was. You know, I went. I went back to the Ministry of Sound a while ago, yeah. and it definitely weren't the same. I was like, you know, yeah, I think my my friend's grandchildren were in there or something. It was, yeah, like, yeah, it, yeah. was it was they were that bad. <laughs> I just we just felt me and me and Tucker were in there. We just felt so out of place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What was your what was your movement then from that Margate? When did it all <clears> like your profile really rose up massively after you did the Craze funeral? Yeah, I mean, it was all. I mean, um, I suppose we might as well. Yeah, we could talk about him. Talk about it now, really. I mean, Dave, Dave Courtney, um, yeah. who's unfortunately, bless his soul. Yeah, yeah, bless his soul. I mean, yeah. I'm sure everyone who's been watching the newspapers, social media, whatever, knows that Dave actually took his life. Um, well, Dave, Dave and I met. Oh, let me see. Uh, I was actually, in fact, the day I met Dave, I think I got shot at that night. That was one. Of, uh, that was one of the nights I got shot at by the gypsies. Where was this? That I'm was done. up at the Kemsley Arms. That was, we, we, I think I think we mentioned it in a previous podcast, yeah. but I, yeah, it was it was it was later that same night. Because I finished at about midnight that night at that place, I then drove to my friend's house in Canterbury, and he knew. He, he said, "I'm going to introduce you to this crazy guy called Mr. Courtney." So we're going to go to the Ministry of Sound, and uh, so we went to the Ministry of Sound. And I, I, in my mind, when you say Ministry of Sound, to me it sounds quite posh. Yeah. And I was expecting the Ministry of Sound, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's not. It was like scaffold poles right. and no carpets and uh, Ministry of Sound. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's different, you know. <laughs> so anyway, we we we've gone there, and uh, Dave didn't in those days. I don't think he turned up till about three or four in the morning. Mm. But anyway, when he did turn up, I got introduced to him and he just made me laugh all mm. night. And I made him laugh. And we just, we just hit it off. I just, I don't know, he was, he was, uh, I just, yeah, belly laughing all night. He yeah. was like, he was funny. And he looked at me when he goes, I'm, I'm glad you like, he said, I'm glad you're having a laugh. He said, because I want to roll around the floor with you. <laughs> you know, and then I think halfway through our sort of conversation that night, he said, um, he said, oh, someone I want you to meet. He said, like, he said, he's a proper soldier, one of my best. He went, nah, Tucker. He went, come over here. I went, Tucker. I went from Graves End. He went, yeah, well, do you know him? And then Tucker just walked out of the shadows. He went, all right, Marcus. <laughs> Quality. Yeah. And he was like, oh, you two you already know each other, do you? Like, yeah. But, but from that sort of moment on, I think we, I, I started, I started enjoying that sort of, because um, I didn't get, a, I didn't get any downtime working in Margate um, or Thanet. You know, I was always working every weekend. I was working actually probably five, six nights a week. Um, so I was—I never really got time to socialise properly, and and actually just you know, I say let me air down. I haven't got any, but <laughs> but you know, just to actually unwind. Yeah. So what happened was after meeting Dave up there, um, I started going up to London quite a bit, and for, well, for the next ten years mm. actually, probably every weekend, mm. um, and that just became my downtime, my relaxing. I never—it it was never work up there really. It was, it was somewhere I'd go to just, I, I, you know, I got thanks to Dave up there, I got to know. 
I got to know all the doormen, um, and I got on really well with all the all the doormen around the West End. I could pretty much, in the end, I could pretty much go to any venue. I was on the VIP list. Yeah. Um, and I did the same for Dave down my end, neck of the woods. You know, Dave was a London boy, and he wasn't. He wasn't, although he was sort of known, people had sort of seen stories about him in the papers and that, but no one ever met the guy. No one mm. really knew him. And I invited him down to the nightclubs in my area. And he got this massive fan club from there. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> everyone loved him. They went, he's nuts, you know? <laughs> um, so, and then we used to have these like big, um, like Soul Coast, also, you know, the weekenders and stuff, you know? Mm. So Dave used to come down and he'd, and he'd bring all his mates and I'd get him, you know, gold wristbands and VIP treatment. So, yeah, we, we both sort of, I suppose we both helped each other. So what sort of age were you when you first met Dave? Were you in your 30s? I you? would be just about, Early 90s? I would be about 30. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because I started my agency when I was 28, um, and it would have been going for a, a few years before I met Dave. So, yeah, I'd have been 30 or early 30s. Well, how, how did, did you see Dave change over the years as well, you got older? Fat, you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, did you um, see him change from what he was when you first met him? Did you see him, obviously, well, obviously late years, he calmed down? and When I first met him, he was um, a, a lot more of a... Although he was, he was always, he always had a good sense of humour, but he was a lot more a lot more serious character, I would have said. Okay. You know? Um, yeah. I mean, he's, I mean, the thing is with Dave, he's like, there's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people who don't like him. Um, some of my best friends don't like Dave, to be honest. You know, Dave's never done anything really bad to me. He's, he's done a few naughty little, you know, annoying things, you know. Um, but um, I might tell you about him in a minute. But, <laughs> but but generally speaking, he's never done me a really bad turn. Yeah. So I've, I, when I was, since obviously since his passing, I've, I've been thinking about it a lot, you know. And I can certainly remember more fun, good times than mm. I can bad ones. Mm. But just I've got a few good friends who have not had such a good experience with Dave, and, and for their own reasons, they really dislike him. But that's up to them, you know? So I'm not here today to sort of say say he's good or he's bad. What everyone can definitely agree with, he was a real funny bugger. Proper character. He was a proper yeah. character. Yeah. If you wanted a good night out, then you would have a laugh if you went out with Dave. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, it was. there were some good funny times. Also, it would get you into some trouble as well. Mm. I mean, there's, you know, I'm not being funny. That, yeah, I mean, there's the one story I'd like, I'd like to actually tell you about this is, that, so the first time I met Dave was in the ministry, and we like I said, we got on really well. And we had such a, both had such a good night. We said, look, we've got to do this again. You know, and I said, look, it's a bit far for me to come. You know, I'm, I'm down in Margate. Mm. I said, and you're up here. I said, look, can't we meet somewhere, somewhere more central? So it wasn't really central, but I used to go to this club called Deja Vu. It was in uh, Swanley. So it meant I didn't have to go right into the city. And it meant he had to come out of his comfort zone a little bit and come and meet me. So we met there, and there's this place only only it closed at two a.m. So anyway, so Dave's driven down, I've driven up, and we've met there, and we've got on it. We've just got on it, and I, because I used to drink in them days, I used to try and be flash. I didn't like champagne, but I used to like splashing it about, and, <laughs> you know. So as soon as the barman used to see me come in, he'd get half a dozen bottles ready, you know. So so me and Dave had worked our way for about six bottles of Moe that night, yeah. and a few other products as well, <laughs> probably. So we've you know we've had a party pill and a bit of this and a bit of that. Two o'clock's come, and it's, we've had a blinding night. But it's time to go home. And probably would have been better if we'd have got a bus or something. You know what I mean? But <laughs> there weren't none about. So we've gone outside anyway. And we said our goodbyes. And Dave at the time was driving this old Mark One Jag, which he just had all restored. It looked it looked immaculate. So he said, right, for a lovely time. Great. I'll see you again. Blah, blah, blah. So he's got in the car and I've sort of waved him goodbye. And I've just watched him drive off down the car park. Well, um, the car, this, this car park, it had, a, it had an in and an out of this car park. And it was surrounded by like a 14 foot eye wall that was like you know brick shit house wall anyway it just drives straight towards this wall and i'm thinking turn turn <laughs> turn bam straight into the wall right i mean it's literally all the front of the car is smashed to bits i've run down the car park and i've opened the passenger door with dave and he's and he's, he's, he's head he's cut his head open on the mirror yeah the, the, the mirror inside cut yeah. his head pissing blood dave what the fuck what, what the fuck happened he goes it slipped into gear he didn't slip into gear. You didn't turn to go out there. It's, you've got to go left. <laughs> you've just drove straight into a wall. He, yeah, whatever. He said, I said, look, mate, I said, look, I, I said, um, he said, he said, he's put it in reverse, right? And he's trying to reverse it, right? But the, the front is so mangled and he's spinning the wheels and it's just burning rubber. And anyway, he's just, he said, I'll get it off. And all of a sudden, the tyres actually burst. He spun them until they burst and covered me in little bits of rubber because I'm standing just beside it. Mm. And I went, Dave, you definitely can't go anywhere now. I said, look, I said, look, mate, I'll, I'll give you a lift home which was very nice of me, but really wasn't a good idea either because I was in just as bad a state as him. <laughs> so anyway, and bear in mind, this is the second time I've ever met this fella. So I went and got my car. He said, oh, can you, I've got some things in the boot, he said. So me, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit pissed. I'm not thinking. Mm. 
I thought, yeah, okay, what put me in? I opened my boot up and he's getting his boxes out of his boot and he's putting his boxes in my boot and I'm not even looking to see what's in them. To be honest, it could have been anything, mm. you know? Uh, anyway, so he's got in the car. He's, he's, head, he's not doing well. He's, he's, he's bleeding, still bleeding quite profusely from his head. But I said, Dave, I, I don't know London. He said, well, I live in Plumstead. I went, it's, it's nowhere to me. I don't know. He said, I'll tell you where. Just get on the A2 and I'll tell you when to turn off. So anyway, so I'm on the A2. I'm driving up there. I keep looking at him. And he's, and he's sitting there like this. And all of a sudden, I looked at him like he's just passed out. Right? He's literally, I think he must, must have got a concussion or something. But he's just like a little blob sitting there bleeding. Right? And I'm thinking, well, drive up the A2 then. <laughs> so I'm, I'm off up the A2. <laughs> anyway, I don't, I can't honestly remember what happened to the time. But the next thing I know, I sort of clipped a traffic island and it sort of like woke me up. <laughs> and I thought, shit. <laughs> anyway, I, I've nudged him. I went, Dave, Dave. He went, what? I said, I, I, I don't know where I am. He said, well, where are you? I said, I, I said, I said, I'm lost. He said, where are you? I said, I don't know. I said, I'm lost. He went, oh, I said, so he's wound down his window right now. This is, um, and a good hour must have gone by, mm. right? The blood has all dried over his face, but he don't look too pretty. He's forgot about that. So he's buzzed the window down. We pull up with a set of traffic lights next to this other car and he stuck his head out the window like this, right? He went, excuse me. And this person went, ah, just drove off, right? <laughs> He went, what's their problem? I said, Dave, your face. Your face is covered in blood, dried blood. He went, oh, yeah. So anyway, we pulled up next to another car. He's done the same thing again. He's trying to wipe his blood off. But he's going, uh, excuse me, where are we? Anyway, blue lights come on behind us. Oh, we didn't know we'd no. been followed by a police car. And all they've seen, from their point of view, we pulled up next to a car, they've shot off. We pulled up next to another car, they shot off. So they've pulled us over, curious. Anyway, so I thought, shit. So there's blue lights come on. Dave's going, oh, I'm so sorry. He goes, you're going to lose your license. I said, Dave, just, shh, shh. You know, and so anyway, I've seen, I'm looking in the mirror, I see the coppers get out. So I'm leaning on my door, because I can see this policeman's walking up his side, on the curb side, right? So I'm leaning on my door, like, look, we're waiting to see this policeman's turn up there. I didn't see the other copper walking up the other side, and he's opened my door. So I fell in the street. So I've literally, I've just, I, 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 ah. so I've, I've landed in the street, and so I'm looking up at this copper, and he went, have you been drinking? I went, of course I have. <laughs> Right, and Dave's, Dave's got the other got the other side. They went right out of the car, out of the car. So we got out of the car and went right, get on the pavement. So uh, this policeman said, right, he said, um, I'm going to breath test you. And Dave went, oh no, he said, you're definitely going to lose your. I said, Dave, shh, please. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so he's got the thing out, and I and I've been, like, I said, we've only just we've not long had a drink. I said, really, I'm entitled to twenty minutes, you know. And he went, yeah, you are. So I got me, I got me twenty minutes, right? So. Anyway, before you sit there, I'm, I'm, I'm taking as many deep breaths as I can and I'm in and out. Anyway, I finally he's giving the thing and I blew in it. And the cop has got his watch out and he's looking at the thing. And he went, you passed. And Dave went, he fucking what? <laughs> I went, Dave, shut up, please. <laughs> right, anyway, this cop went, right, he said, I'm going to search your car now. Any objections? I went, no, so search away. He said, uh, I said, where Dave's got in the car, Dave is known always for carrying a knuckle duster. Yep. I never carry a knuckle duster. Mm. And there's a knuckle duster in the middle of my, my console, right? So the cop went, ah. And, and, and I went, that's his. And Dave went, you fucking grass. <laughs> right? I went, well, it's not mine, is it? It's yours. You put it there. So anyway, so he went, right, I said, well, I'm going to search, I'm going to search the back, you know, back of the car. So anyway, in the back of the, in the back, on the back seat was my training bag. But unfortunately, inside my training bag, it had a 19 inch long knife, which had spiked knuckle dusters on it. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, took a bit of explaining. And <laughs> he, went, he went, and this, I went, that's an ornament. He went, an ornament? I said, yeah, my mate brought it back from Thailand. That's an ornament. I said, but I said, it's in my gym bag. I said, I just took it down the gym tonight to show me other mate in the gym. He went, really? He said, you're nicked. He said, we're nicking you for that. We're nicking you for that. He said, right, what's in the boot? And now I'm thinking, oh, shit. What has he put in my yeah. boot? <laughs> right, because he just put boxes in there. You know, it could yeah. be cocaine or something. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm thinking, shit. I said, I don't even really know what's in there, you know. He said, it's your boot. I said, yeah, but, you know. So he's opened the boot. I'm thinking, oh, what is it going to... Anyway, luckily, it's like boxes of flyers. Yeah. Right? Dave had a, a party or a rave or something. Mm. Being, so this was like all the flyers. But in amongst the flyers, they're going through the flyers. I'm thinking, fuck, it's flyers. Anyway, they find a set of handcuffs. So this cop was going, oh, what are these? I said, that's in case we pulled a bird. <laughs> right? But this other cop was writing everything down. I say, he's going, in case we pulled a bird. I went, no, I'm joking. No, I'm joking. joking. Right, he wrote down everything I was saying. I was like, Stop right, stop right in it. You know, it was like that. So he went right. Dave, Dave's, <laughs> Dave's head was still pretty bad. So this cop went right. He said, "You, you're going to the hospital." 
All right? He said, you, you're going to the Acne Police Station, which is where we was in Acne. <laughs> we were supposed to be going to Plumstead. Yeah. How do I end up in Acne? <laughs> but we was in Acne. So I went to Acne Police Station. Not a very nice place. Anyway, they took me there. And I've got a, a bit of a sense of humour myself when it comes to things. So um, we'd already had a bit of a laugh with the, already with this cop was about this. But I've got to the police station and they, they, they searched me. Anyway, they found a, they found, well, they, first of all, they found 700 quid in my pocket. And, and a plastic little plastic bag, which was totally empty. It's like this little plastic bag. So they've pulled me out of the cell and they've got me. And bearing in mind, I'm still off me nut. So I'm sat like this, and this cop went, he's pushed this plastic, this plastic bag across the table. He went, Do you recognize that? <laughs> oh, mate, I said, I'm no detective. I said, but that looks like a plastic bag to me. <laughs> he, went, <laughs> he went, He said, You had 700 pounds on you when we found you. I said, Is that all I got left? <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he didn't have the same sort of sense of humor with me. Anyway. But then I'd left my wallet and my ID was in the car. He said, um, you've got no ID on you. I said, well, it was in the car. I said, I forgot I forgot to bring it. I said, but he said, well, how do we know you are Marcus Redwood from Margate? I said, I'll tell you what, ring the police station. I said, they know me. <laughs> right? And he went, all right. So he put me back in the cell, <laughs> put me back in the cell. And he went, he went away, come back about 10 minutes later. He went, yeah, they know you. He said, they know you. He said, not exactly Snow White though, are we? <laughs> right? I said, I didn't say I was Snow White. I said, but... They did vouch for me, yeah. They, they, you know, they you know, described me. He said, "Yeah, they definitely know you." He said, "Right, you're you're here for the night." He said, "We'll release you sometime tomorrow." Mm. So anyway, they charged me with um, of two two counts of offensive weapons. Um, they couldn't charge me anything else, really. That was it. Um, but they, but it, it was going to go to like it was going to go to Crown Court. Well, it went to magistrates, and I'd elected to go to Crown. So the thing was, it took obviously these things take months. Mm. So in the months that followed, obviously I got to know Dave. This is my this is my second night with Dave, yeah. right? <laughs> And I've now been nicked and spent the night in the police station, you know. Yeah. And um, yeah, so it was it was hilarious. We had to go to court. We had a three day hearing in a Crown Court in London. Now, what I luckily the, the things that I'd said, I had to back up now, mm. right? So that knife, like I said, it was a it was a, an ornament. Well, it was actually bought for me by a good friend of mine who got it from Thailand before I'd even been there myself, because he knew I liked collecting weapons, you know, like swords and stuff. Mm. So he couldn't get me a sword, so he got me the next best thing was this looking great knife with the knuckle duster. And my other friend, actually, Ricky Hards, um, he at the time owned a gym in Ramsgate, and he was doing, he worked for the WOW, which is the World of Wrestling. Mm. So he was a wrestler, and he wanted a prop. And I had actually been to the gym that night with my bag, with this great big knife in it, to show him. And he was going to use it and blunt the edge off of it and just use this as a prop, right, for his wrestling. So I had to get him to come to court and say all this, but it didn't, you know, it didn't sound too... It didn't sound too believable. But anyway, but my, the, my main witness for the night was Mr. Courtney <laughs> for that day. So I'm in so the three-day hearing. I'm in court the first day. And the first day is all about prosecution, yeah? So I'm in there and I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a suit looking as small as I could because I was quite big then. So I'm trying to... In a you dark, were what, six foot three, 20 stone, right? Well, six foot two. Six, six foot, foot two, two and, about, and, about, and probably about 19 Nine, stone then. Okay. But I was in good nick. So, yeah. so I've got a suit on and I'm trying to make myself look small and I'm, you know, innocent. And... Um, it weren't, it weren't, it weren't working. <laughs> but I'm, I'm smart and I'm polite. So, you know, yeah. when you go in, you got all the, you know, you look, you look the jury in the eye and you swear on the Bible like yeah. you really mean it, you know? Yeah. And uh, so I've done all that and I think you're right. I've done it. Anyway, and they're looking like, I can hear this noise coming from the gallery. It's like, oh, oh, Dave, oh, oh, he's shagging his missus upstairs. In the court? In the court. You're joking me. I'm in there. I'm in the dock. <laughs> I'm in the dock having my charges read out and he's shagging his bird up there. <laughs> And all I can hear is this, like, Dave, Dave. <laughs> right? <laughs> Quality. That was the first day. Yeah. <laughs> right? So anyway, I'm thinking, well, we are going to be right shit here. He's my star witness. So anyway, when it comes to uh, calling the witnesses, right, now all my normal witnesses turn up and did their normal bit of, you know, about the knife and the wrestler and all mm. that. They all did theirs. But so when Dave's got called, right, he's, he's got in the dock. I'm thinking, no, please. Because you're over this side, he's over there. And he's, he's all in black. So he's got black shirt, black trousers, no jacket, open neck shirt. Gold chain, big gold chain, gold knuckle duster hanging outside. Right? I thought, lovely. Just the way to Just, behave yeah. in court, right? So I'm looking at him thinking, why? Why have I got you as my witness? Anyway, the prosecutors then started questioning Mr. Courtney. Says, uh, it says here, he says that you, uh, you're an actor and that you manage a pop band. He said, uh, what sort of acting do you do? He said, well, he said, uh, I have written off to Baywatch, he said, but they haven't written back yet. He said, normally I play a villain. Right, and at that, the jury just started erupted with laughter. 
And I thought, ah, I get it, I get it now, right? And this guy's going to me, so, so how do you look at yourself? And he turned sideways and went, well, normally like that. <laughs> <laughs> right? That and is so Dave. It, it was not mate. Everything, <laughs> everything this guy was trying to say, yeah. if he could, he took the piss. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But he was so cheeky with it and so funny with it and the jury loved it, right? So this went on, like I said, this three-day thing. And I've got all these exhibits, you know, my knife's in a bag, you know, they pass it around, exhibit one and exhibit two. Yeah. Anyway, and finally, and it, when it got to the summing up, um, they read out they read out the statement about that's in case we pulled a bird and yeah, all that, yeah. all that shit, you know. So, for, but and I and I sort of got onto the same buzz as him. I could understand. So I, even when I was doing my little bits, I was also getting a bit of a chuckle out of the jury. Um, by this time, I've also made friends with the policemen who are actually against us because I, I used to smoke in them days. And in between the days, when we're having breaks outside, I'll go, Can you "Give us a light, fellas." Mm. And my, my sister said, "Don't talk to the police. Don't talk to the police." And I said, "They're all right." I said, "I'm doing their job." So I know, and this is after the first couple of days, this cop went, she wish we hadn't nicked you. He goes, you're really all right, aren't you? He said, you're a nice fella, <laughs> right? So it was, it was proper funny. But when he got to the summing up, so the prosecutor on the last day is doing his summing up. And he said, uh, he said, well, I, I put it to you. I went, sorry, when he's doing Dave's summing up. He said, I put it to you, Mr. Courtney. He said, uh, he said the reason you and Mr. Redwood were driving around the, in London at 4 a.m. in the morning with a knuckle duster, a knife and handcuffs in the car was you was waiting to use that on somebody. And Dave went, well, that's just not true. He said, he said, there was a great big rubber dildo there. He said, and we weren't waiting to use that on anyone, was we? <laughs> now, there was no dildo in the car, right? <laughs> but he said that, and again, the jury were wetting themselves, right? Yeah. And they put that in the newspaper. Yeah. So that, this like sex toys thing was in the like, headlines. Yeah. My parents read it. <laughs> <laughs> My mum was going, what are you doing with a dildo, dildo in the car? <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm like, yeah. oh, you know, but anyway, at the end of all this three day hearing, I got not guilty. They gave me my knife back. They gave him his knuckle duster back and his handcuffs, right? And it was not guilty. It was it was so bizarre, you know. It was it was was really that is hilarious. Quality. So I learned. I actually <laughs> learned a lot about about court appearances because and to make people laugh, turn something serious oh, into something. Yeah, I mean you, you know you're going. That's a you know, gift. You got weapons. You got yeah. you got weapons that look horrific. Yeah, you know, and these people, the jury are laughing about it. Go, I'll give it back. <laughs> He's a lovely fella. <laughs> you know what I mean? What was your relationship like after that? Did that? Did it, was there any point when it, your relationship was tarnished a little bit? Oh, no, I need to step back away well, from this. Or? It was at that point, it wasn't too bad. But you see, what happened was, um, so we did the, so after that came the craze funeral. Because yeah. like I said, I was, getting, I was getting sort of deeper and deeper into this sort of underworld in London, yeah. if you like. Because, I, because of my friendship with Dave, it started off with Dave. Then it was like, then it was like meeting Freddie Foreman and Frankie Fraser yeah. and, and all the boys, you know, and you just, all of a sudden you're in this, you're in this world that yeah. you've only read about. Yeah. And it was quite, it was, it was quite, it was very flattering. It was very surreal mm. for me. And I wasn't, I, I never, I'm not, I don't consider myself a gangster, mm. right? Because I wasn't, I'm a doorman. Yeah. <laughs> I was a doorman who's done all right for himself. Yeah. But, but meeting those guys, I loved it. I can't, I can't, you know, I can't lie to you. I absolutely loved their company. I used to love, there was another old boy. We used to, Dave used to have a club in Deptford. And there was a guy called Harry Hayward who I believe was a member of the Hole in the Wall gang years ago. Mm. And they were like, they'd arm robberies and stuff, yeah, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah? And I used to, when the rave was on, everyone else would be in the rave, and I would be sitting in the office with Harry, listening to his stories. Brilliant. Because he was just a quality geezer, mm. you know? And his stories were, were, to me, more entertaining than what was going on out there mm. in the club. You know, so I used to love, yeah, I used to love meeting all these people, all these characters, and... Yeah, uh, it was just it was just awesome. Mm. What was your relationship? Do you have any relationship with any dormant sort of north in the Midlands and up north, Manchester, Liverpool, uh, yeah, Birmingham? Yeah, I, uh, I met. Well, I met the Bailey brothers. I met someone. I met Chris Bailey. In, in, to be honest, uh, Chris Bailey and Warren Treasure. Mm. Warren Treasure was a huge um, uh, black bodybuilder guy, massive. How um, big? How big? Oh, big! I mean, bigger oh, than me. Much yeah. bigger than me. He's like a universe job. You know, he's oh, okay. Like, boom! I mean, monster. Whereabouts? Um, whereabouts in the country? Uh, where's Bailey Brothers from? I can't remember. I'm going to go blank now. Yeah. Um, but there was, the, there was apparently there's three Bailey Brothers. They used to run, they used to do the, the security for Luminar, yeah, same I as don't. I did. Yeah. And that's that's when I when I met them was when Luminar bought the club in Margate. Um, when they, they opened, um, what was it called then? Just trying before it was Escape. Uh, Indi no, I can't remember. No, I can't remember. It might come to me. Anyway, they owned a big club in Margate, massive new club. And one of my friends started off running the door there because I got him the job there. But I ended up working for them. Long and the short of it was mm -hmm. I ended up working for that company anyway. But I met them because they sent 
They used to send Chris Bailey down mm. to any new venue they opened up as a bit of a bodyguard sort yeah. of thing. If they heard there was a few local tough nuts, they wanted to make sure there was a couple of their own tough nuts yeah. there to greet them. So Warren, Warren, Warren Treasure and uh, Chris Bailey actually ended up training in my gym. Dying. And that's how I met them. So, yeah. Um, then there was another guy I met, um, Stevie Wraith, who's from Newcastle. Yeah. Stevie, um, I met Stevie when he was, he did the crazy funeral with us. He must have been really young. He's probably 20, you know, or early 20s. Um, because he's, I mean, now he's sort of like considered as a bit of an authority on the, you know, on the, the Geordie connection, as he calls mm. it, with the craze and the, you know, North. Mm. But he was, he was a real gentleman, much older than his years. You know, mm. when he was a young man, he had that, he had that sort of old school um, character about mm. him. So, yeah, I've remained friends with Steve. I haven't seen him for quite a few years, but he's written plenty of books and mm. things. Yeah, we still sort of just now and again stay in touch. And what, and what was it like for you on that weekend, on that day? With the craze funeral, and you got like two hundred wow. lumps all coming in from all different parts of the UK. They might have had beef with each other. Was everyone nice to each other? Yeah, I, I never saw anything other than that. And I, I made I made loads of friends on that day as well because yeah. we were standing about a lot. We were walking together in the crowds, but you met loads of like minded sort of mm. people. <laughs> uh, and the funny thing was, actually, at the end of the day, we were all supposed to meet. That all the all the security were told to meet in the blind beggar to get paid. None of us got paid. <laughs> No one got paid. No one got paid. Not. Yeah, no. Were you offered a certain amount? They say, "What well, you're going to get I, looked I, after." I honestly it, can't remember. Or was it more of an honour? I, I honestly can't remember. We were supposed to be getting paid, though. But yeah, but we were all told to meet in the gut in the blind beggar. So we all met in there, and it was just you can imagine it, can't you? All that, all them doormen, all yeah. those great big hard men, trying to cram into this boozer. <laughs> And then no, no one turned up to pay us. And we all just thought, ah, bollocks. You know, it was but a good yeah, day, wasn't it? It was yeah. a good day. You know, it was a, it was a bit of an honour to do that um, for the craze. But that that really caused me, um, it ripped, the ripple effect of that was people in my area suddenly see me on the TV. And it wasn't just, I mean, the people suddenly got a lot more respect for you. Going, oh, he knows all them naughty yeah. people up there, you know. Yeah, if he tells you to leave, but leave. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but it also had the other effect where the police all of a sudden went, what is he doing up there? Mm. So they've... Yeah, they they took real interest in me after that, and they opened up a file on me, the Genesis file. Um, and uh, yeah, next thing I know, I've got like six pages on me on this Genesis file, and I only knew that because I've got friends in the police, and a couple of them came up to me and gave me the nod and went, "Look, you know, they're looking at you." Yeah. Um, but it got, and at first I thought it was, I was quite flattered. I thought it was mm. quite funny, <laughs> you know. And it is funny until they kick your doors in at about mm. five o'clock in the morning mm. or six o'clock in the morning. Suddenly you got twelve coppers smashing away through your house. You go, "What are we doing?" You know. <laughs> But yeah, I uh, I got raided quite a lot. I got raided. My house got raided. My offices got raided. My car got raided. Um, they did. They did catch me with a bit of personal because I used to like to party and go to a rave now yeah. and again. They tried to make out I was a dealer, which I never was. Um, but they still had it in their head. But the, the the biggest the biggest one they did was called Operation Mayflower. So Operation Mayflower was a massive thing. It involved 120 police officers from I think it was five different counties. Mm. So we're talking about, you know, really big. And it had like, I think over six months surveillance. They spent over a million pound on surveillance. And I was getting followed around. I was having my phone was getting tapped. Um, it was, and they, they, did it, they did it to me, Big Lloyd, mm. Ricky Hards, mm. and two police officers. So it was five of us that were on that list, on this watch Two list. police officers? Yeah. Yeah, because they- They thought they were on the inside. They thought we were paying them. They, really? thought, they thought they were working for us. Right. I mean, you know, God, I was only, I don't know what age I was. I was, th I don't know, I was no major mastermind. Yeah. But they, they, <laughs> How old were you? Roughly 30, was it? I, I, no, I must have been, by that time I was probably 35. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, probably 35. Yeah. So it's sort of like after this is, you know, I mean, I, my, my reputation has got bigger after the craze. Yeah. Bigger because I was with Dave. Yeah. And then I took more and more venues and clubs and I was in other areas. So they watched me. And also, obviously, I was making more money. So I was buying nicer cars. Yeah. Um, I was but I had more diamond rings. Mm. I was like, I was, mm. yeah. I was, you know, I was spending what I was earning. Mm. I was having a great time. Um, but yeah, they obviously thought I wasn't. They thought I was making it out other ways. They thought I was, you know, I was. I, he must have all these doors. He's in, linked with all in villains. They've got to be doing drugs, you know. Mm. So they were hell bent on this thing, you know, about me being a drug dealer, which I never was mm. and never will be. Mm. You know, I'm not. I'm not only saying I'm an angel because I wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, yeah, yeah. I used to love to party. <laughs> <laughs> Shame I got old. <laughs> you know, but I've had to calm down. But um, sorry, I've gone off track again. Where was I? So. Uh, Mayflower, yeah, Mayf Operation, Operation Mayflower. Mayflower. Why were they? Well, they were on your case because they thought you were serving up. Yeah, or, and what else they were in the case for? It can't have just been. They, just no, the they drugs. thought they thought I was like I was. According to them, according to the, uh, the the file that's secret and I don't know anything about, I was a <laughs> I was a, a, a drug importer, I was a gun runner, I was a hitman, um, I was 
I was like an enforcer, a debt collector, which some of it's true. Um, <laughs> but but they had it basically that I you know I basically I deal drugs and kill people. Mm. You know I was like I was really I was and I was I was a major kingpin. Mm. I was up there. Um, but it, you know it, it really wasn't like that. Um, I mean Lloyd was my training partner at the time, so me and Lloyd were always together. We worked on the doors together. We trained together. You know, uh, Ricky Hards was another another really good friend of mine. Still good friends of mine. He, he lives in New York now, but he owned a gym and he also used to put on these parties called Juicy Tunes. So they were obviously, a, you know, a rave type thing. So they were drug orientated parties. You know, everyone would be peeled up. Yeah. So they were, he started those illegally first when you, you know, you're doing like a, in a warehouse yeah. in the middle of nowhere, but ended up having proper parties mm. because of, because of me, because I was friends with him and I had my connections with the big nightclubs. I managed to link him yeah. with the big nightclubs and do it properly. Yeah. Um, but then where the police came in, the police came in because, uh, Jim Osmond, who I won't mind me mentioning him, I'm sure. <laughs> he's retired from the police now. But Jim, was a, he's a lovely guy. He looks like a doorman. He looks mm. a bit like me. He's got a goatee and a, and a few muscles, <laughs> you know. Uh, but he's a, he was a great guy, and he used to train in my gym. And because I already knew him, in there, he knew me better than most people. So instead of listening to the gossip, he actually knew me because he, he actually came in my gym and got to know me. Mm. And he he said to me, you know, he said, you're a nice guy. You're not. I hear all these stories about you, mm. you know. And so... But he had, he kept looking me up. I didn't ask him to look me up, but he was just nosy, I suppose, and he kept looking me up on this file. So when you go in there, you have to put your number in, your police number, and, and a reason for why you're doing it. So they thought that I must be just asking him for the information. What they actually did to try and try and sort of get me on this was a, I think it's called entrapment. I don't think they're actually mm. allowed to do it. But what it was, I got I got uh, I got followed through. I knew I'd been I knew I was being followed a lot by undercovers. So one night I'm leaving. I'm leaving to go and see Ricky Hards, who was living in London. So I'm leaving Thanet. I've got a, I've got a bag full of you know, clothes and a suit and everything in mm. the car. And I'm, unfortunately, I just dropped a big grammar whiz. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'm, I'm prepared for my night out, right? I'm getting ready to party. So I'm, <laughs> I'm leaving Margate, and I, and I notice I'm getting followed by this unmarked car. So I thought, shit. And then while I'm busy looking at him, all of a sudden I got I got just cut off by all these other police cars. I've got five of them. I've got dog vans and no. vans and police cars. They've surrounded me. They pulled me up on Market Seafront. And I wound the window down and in my usual funny way, I went, let me guess. I went, you want me to pull over? <laughs> and he went, very funny, Redwood, get out of the car. <laughs> so I got out of the car and they just started ripping my car to bits, right? And I thought, shit. I said to the bloke, I said, what, what are you doing? He said, information received. I was like, okay, what's that mean? You know, so anyway, so he carried on and, he's, and he kept radioing back. Going, no, I found nothing yet, Gov, nothing. Try that, okay. Try the boot, try ripping the seat up, try ripping it. And they're, they're literally pulling the car apart for half an hour, right? And they can't find anything, right? So I went like, I'm getting a bit cocky. I like, can, can I go now? Yeah. And he went, hang on a minute. He went, you want to go? No, strip search, okay. So I'm now going for a fucking strip <laughs> search. <laughs> Right, when I've had whiz, whiz the, the, I'm not exactly like hung like a donkey in the normal times, right? But now I'm like a gnat in a wind tunnel. So I'm, I'm thinking, oh my god, and it's not like it's not like your mates just caught you having a piss and gone, oh, you know. I mean, I can't go. I've had a bit of gear, yeah. You know, so I'm, I'm in there now. I take every bit. I don't know if you've ever strip search. It's very embarrassing, mm. especially when you've had whiz. Mm. So I, one item of clothing at a time comes off, and you get down to your pants, and it's like pants. And I'm like, oh god, and this cop was like. <laughs> went, he went squat so you have to squat on the floor so there's nothing up your ass you know so anyway after this humiliation he's gone you can take your clothes <laughs> and it does say big guy on my number plate you know yeah, what I mean which yeah. also throws you know it's not, anyway it's, it's yeah. quite funny I suppose it's funny now it wasn't very funny no. at the time trust me but did you not put up a fight there hold no, on a minute no, strip what's, search is another level hold what, on what's the point really no, okay. you know, I mean at the end of the day it, 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 the inevitable is going to happen. If I put up a fight, then I'm just going to add assault on a yeah, police okay. officer. Yeah. So you not know, actually a fight, no. but verbally, I ain't oh, no. going to get well, so I didn't want to, you know what yeah. I mean? But you know, they didn't. They didn't really give me a lot of choice. Like I said, I would. I, I did protest about it. Yeah. But he's like, no, you've got to have a strip search, and that's the way it is, you know. And there's two coppers there, and it's like, you know, do it. <laughs> you got to do it. I suppose, you know, like I said, you could have could have thought it, but you'd end up, I wanted to have, I was, I was on my way to London for a night out. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to I go. Up, yeah. yeah. I was already whizzing. I just <laughs> wanted to go. You know what I mean? <laughs> But I got out of there and I thought, oh, you know, I'm rung Ricky. He never gets what happened to me on the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, bit of a funny story. How did you How did you sense that you were being followed everywhere undercover, old Bill? Did I, you just have, you, well, everything's got a sixth sense, haven't Yeah, we? I mean, I'm, look, I'm, I'm pretty, I like to think I'm pretty switched on anyway. I certainly was when I was younger. Um, you know, if, I, I just clocked it. I clocked it when I was in bars. There'd be people who didn't fit in, yeah. who were following me. I'd go to restaurants, someone sat over there at a table watching me, yeah. you know, within listening distance. Um, 
And, and I, yeah, I just, and this, and the unmarked cars in our area, there's only so many of them. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. but what they did, what they did, sorry, what the police did. So they, after that, that was the, that was the first time I really, that really pissed me off actually. Mm. So I've now, I know I'm under their radar. I know they've been following me. I now know I'm under their radar. About a week after that, I get a letter through the post, through my, through my letterbox. And I open it up and it's, uh, it's like a warning. And it says, uh, you're being, the police are following you. The police are looking into you. Um, but there's a guy, this guy's giving him information about you. He's grassing you up to the police and he's driving a Ford Mondeo, red Ford Mondeo registration, blah, blah, blah. So I thought, right. It doesn't tell me his name. Just gives me the registration of it and what sort of car he's got. So I've got a mate who's a policeman, haven't I? Mm. So I'm thinking, I can find out now. I'll get a PNC check done. Not thinking that it's actually the police who sent me the letter. So I actually, my, my, my copper Jim went, oh, I can't do that. Right, so he's quite open up in front about it. He said, I don't want to get involved in that. So okay, sorry, Jim. So I rung Lloyd, because Lloyd used to also train with another guy called Kelvin, who was a CID, mm. right? So he said to his mate, his training partner, he goes, yeah, can you check that out for Marcus? He said, like, it's, you know, someone's grasped him up to the old bill or something. So he checked it. He went and checked the registration, run it for us. It was flagged. So when it flagged up, so that means the police now know that that policeman Somehow, because they put him through my letterbox, yeah. but that policeman's checked it. So now they, they, they're now because they were tapping my phone. Yeah, they've even got my phone call. I've, I've got it. I've rung Lloyd. Lloyd's rung him. He's checked it. He's rung Lloyd back. Lloyd's rung me back. Right. So it didn't it didn't do anything straight away. They just kept that information to themselves. Then about another week or ten days later, a very similar thing. Another letter. He's changed cars now. He's now driving a blue blah 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 blah. Mm. Right. So I'm trying to check that one now, and I've done the same thing. I've rung Lloyd, Lloyd's rung him, he's checked it, he's rung Lloyd, he's rung me. After that, we all got raided. Wow. Right, all got dawn raids. We all got taken to different areas. So I think I got taken to, I got taken to Folkestone, I think. Mm. Um, and some, someone got taken to Dover, someone went to Canterbury. We all got sh shifted off to different places. Uh, one of the things I quite used to be quite good at was remembering numbers in those mm. days. And while the police were raiding my house, for, um, which which I was quite lucky they didn't really find much they found a shotgun actually mm. which I didn't have a license for at the time but anyway they, but they, they found, I, only a shotgun only a, yeah only a <laughs> pump action three inch magnum and uh, but they weren't interested in that they wanted me for this other thing yeah. don't even charge me for it anyway but um, I got, <laughs> so while they were while they were ripping me house apart I just kept remembering their, like their badge their lapel mm. numbers and mm. stuff like that and the guy in charge had a clipboard and he had, they must get given a mobile phone for the day or something because the number for their mobile phone is on the top of the clipboard, right? So I'm standing behind him while they're all ripping me out to bits and I'm, I've memorised his, his phone number. And uh, anyway, they've, they finally got to the point where they went, right, you're, you're coming to the police station, we're going to take you to folks and whatever. So I've gone up there and uh, he said, um, what was it? I'm allowed a phone call. And uh, I made a phone call, just, I can't remember if I made a phone call too, but I said, oh, if you need to get hold of me, you can get me on 0794, blah, 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 blah. And I said this copper's number. And he went, how do you know my phone number? Right? And I'm like, I said, I've got friends, haven't I? <laughs> right? <laughs> and I, I started really, I started playing with them. Yeah. Right? And um, so they locked us all up in cells. And then what they kept doing all day long was they pull one of us out and go, well, Lloyd said this about this and yeah. you know, Marcus said that. And... The truth was, none of us had said anything, mm. okay? And they just kept trying to... They, they did you all know before you got Nick? Did you, everyone, did you know all of that? Like, well, no, we, no, I didn't. I, I just, I hoped they'd all yeah. be sensible enough yeah. to, to keep them. Yeah. Um, that's it. I did get a phone call. It was to, I think it was Alex Little. Mm. Alex Little actually tipped me off as to where everyone was and what was going on, right? So that gave me, on the phone call, one phone call I had, I got so much information off of him. Because I, when I went back, when they pulled me out again for questioning, I went, so Lloyd's in Dover and so-and-so's in this and that. He went, how do you know that? <laughs> right? Because I'm, I'm locked up. Yeah. But I'd had this one phone call yeah. and this guy gave me all this information. So, yeah, it was, it was I've really messed with their heads. Um, but by the end of the day, we we're talking like the end of the day, we're right into the evening. Mm. This dinner, And this, this copper's name was DC Lord. And uh, he, he's sitting opposite me and he's, saying, he's going through things. And I said, look. He said, how do you know about the Genesis file? And I said, yeah, while we're on the subject of the Genesis file, I went, that really pisses me off, that file. I said, because apart from the fact you've got 28 pages on me and the last entry was November the 22nd and blah, 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 yeah. right? And I'm not quoting it to him. Yeah. I went, it's not even true. I said, it's not even what I've done. It's not a record. It's, it's an intelligence file, which means you write any shit down you want in there about me. Like, I'm a hitman. Mm. I'm a drug dealer. Mm. I'm a whatever. I said, and that, when someone follows my car and my number comes up, that shit comes up. Mm. So they then think... 
that I am what you're putting there. Yeah, yeah. I said, that's not fair. Were they trying to put that on you to prevent you losing the doors, do you reckon? They was. They did they tried, want you? Did uh, they not want you in that town anymore? They didn't like my control. No, okay. They honestly didn't like my control. They, I mean, when, when the door licences first came in, um, I didn't get one. Yeah. I couldn't get one. What year roughly we're talking here? Uh, this is the not the not the SIA licences, but the previous the licences. Previous, okay. So it's a long time ago, but yeah. I was assured that I would get one. And then when I actually went to get one, they said no. They turned me down because I've been arrested so many times for like, even though I hadn't been charged, I would have been charged, but not not found guilty. Yeah. But I've been up for so many assaults and GBHs and ABHs and affrays and all sorts of shit. Um, but I was always fighting. So mm. no, no surprise, mm. but I wasn't the one who started. But anyway, they, they didn't, they turned me down. So what happened then was the very week after I didn't get a badge, I came to work with a suit on and became a manager. And so they drove past and went... What, a manager of the club, yeah. you mean? Oh, okay. Yeah, he's, he's there. He's still, <laughs> he's still there. I was like, yeah, he's here, Dorman. I'm the manager. Brilliant. Yeah, and they couldn't do anything about it. And that really pissed them off. Brilliant. So that really pissed them off. Yeah, so they, so for many years, that, that worked. And, I, you know, I, just, I was just a manager of the club. Mm. But then as my, as the, before the, it was quite a few years before the SIA come in, by the time the SIA come in, most of my actual, uh, any conviction I had was then spent. So then mm. I was able to get a real door license, mm. you know. I find it fascinating you've never been banged up. You're so do I. Isn't it? So lucky. Isn't it? We would chat about it offline. So amazing. <laughs> amazing. <clears throat> yeah. I want to go, I want to roll a little bit back a little bit there. What's a fray? A fray is um, basically when you plan, like if, 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 you know, if three of you sit down and go, right, we're going to go over there and smash that pub up. Yeah. Then you've planned it. It's right, a planned okay. attack on something. It's an affray. It's a serious charge. Um, you know, there's conspiracy charges, there's a fray, um, violent public disorder. I've been done for that. Mm. <laughs> but, um, you know, I even got banned from Tankerton for a year once. What's that? What's Tankerton? <laughs> it's, a, it's a town. <laughs> for? I, I, I went to do a debt collecting there. And um, yeah, and, I, and, and it, it all went a bit horribly wrong. And uh, they, they sort of attacked us. And uh, they, they, they hurt the guy who's, who, we, who was, we were working for, who's, who's, who's the money they owed to. But um, I ended up bashing the granny out of the guy and uh, the police all jumped on us and arrested us. And yeah, we went to court. I mean, I had, I had lots of injuries. I had 40 odd stitches in my head. They, they, they attacked me with like a socket wrench and I had big flaps of skin hanging off my head. Oh. Um, that was the time when I had my, I had my arm in plaster cast at that time and I'd, I broke the plaster off and, Still and that, so I could make a fist. And I ran back in and smashed the shit out of him. <laughs> Didn't know the police were coming. I was yeah. like, oh, I got jumped on and all of a sudden, oh, coppers. So but when we both went to court, this guy, Moxley and myself, he was a big old lump. But we were both in court and his face was black and blue and my head's all stitches and blood. And yeah, they went, you two have done enough damage to each other, but you're going to be banned from Tankerton for a year. Wow. I was, I was bound over to keep the peace for a year and banned from Tankerton. How many times do you reckon you've been arrested? Oh, I honestly never kept count, but a lot. I mean, I mean, not, not luckily not so much recently. <laughs> <laughs> But None in the last in, five years? No, yeah, I have, yeah. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah. And today you're 60? 61. 61, yeah. bloody hell. Yeah, 61. How many, <laughs> looking good for 61, Mark. I'm not doing too bad. You're looking good, yeah. mate. How many, roughly, how many direct and arrests you've had? I don't know. Um, 100? Got to be. Got to be 100. But there was a time, there was a, there was a really, actually, I'll tell you about a really funny story. I had a, well, it was not <laughs> funny. Oh, no, when I first started working for Thorley Taverns, just before I started working for Thorley Taverns, I was married to my first wife, Tracy, and there was a party at her house and all these people turned up and I, you know, I was there. And what I didn't know was there was a guy there. Um, I won't, I won't I'll, just, I'll just call him Paul. I won't say his surname because he's probably grown up and grown up, you know, being a bit better behaved now, but he tried to <laughs> my wife at, at my wife's party, at my, at my wife's party in her mother's house. You're joking, man. No, he, he tried to push her into a bedroom to have his way with her. She never told me because she knew how short-tempered I was. She knew I would have just kicked straight off. But she told me afterwards, which was really stupid. So I was really angry and I wanted to get this guy. So I'm looking for this guy for three months. I can't find him. And the day, the very first weekend, I got a job with Thorley Taverns working at this place called Thorley's. I'm on the door and a guy walks in. And I'm like, uh, you can imagine how I feel, right? I am boiling. I want to, I, I want to battle. I'm thinking, no, from his first night on the job, I don't want to lose this job. And he's part of a stag, stag party. About 12 of them have walked in and he's one of them. So I, I told the head doorman there, because I wasn't, I was just a new, new doorman. I was 23 then, I think, 23. Mm. So I said to this head doorman, I said, listen, mate, when he leaves tonight, I said, I told him why. I went, I'm, I'm getting him outside. Mm. I need to have a talk to him. Mm. So anyway, as, as they've walked out, I've gone outside and I went, hey, mate, I went, you know, your, your name's Paul. Mm. Anyways, and he went, yeah. I said, you was at a party three months ago. Yeah, what of it? 
I said, what have you? I said, try to my missus. He went, yeah, do you know what about? I said, mate, you did. You pushed her into a bedroom. I've got two witnesses, two yeah. other women actually pulled you off of her, mm. right? And I've been looking for you for three months. And his answer was, well, so what if I did? Oh. So that was the wrong answer. Mate, that's the wrong, was the wrong answer. answer. So I've got like, bang! And I've hit him with everything I've got. And his jaw literally just went, oh, on the side of his head. It unhinged. So his jaws just come off. And he's hit the deck really hard. And and I, I turned around and all his stag party there. And I went, pick that piece of shit. I'm taking it to the hospital. Yeah. Right. And to me, that was it. Job done. I hit him yeah. once. Yeah. Right? I didn't I didn't go over the top. I wanted to. I wanted to yeah. really, I wanted to kill him. But I didn't. I hit him once and I broke his jaw. And uh, what I didn't know was that one of the guys in the stag deal was also an off-duty policeman. Oh. <laughs> so the uh, next thing I know, um, and I used to work six nights a week then, or seven nights a week, actually, at, for Thorley's. And all of a sudden, a, a little while later, police cars turned up at my house, um, Perkins Avenue, where I lived. I've gone to work. It was like half nine. i have already at work. Policeman knocks on the door, says to my wife, she says, um, Marcus here? She went, well, no, he's at work. Well, are you telling him he needs to come and see us? We need to talk to him about this assault charge. And I knew what it was straight away. Well, I didn't go. So anyway, it kept coming. So in the end, my wife said, look, why do you keep coming around here? You know he goes to work. You know where he's working. Mm. You know, he's, <laughs> she said he doesn't want, to call, doesn't want to talk to you. So anyway, it went on for months and months. And then one night I'm at work on a, like a Tuesday night and these two, two CID and a big copper turn up and they, they walk upstairs. He said, I'm looking for Marcus Redford. I went, well, you found him. He said, right, you accompany us down to the police station. I went, nope. He went, what do you mean no? I said, I'm working. I said, I'm on the door. I'm the only one here. Uh, I said, oh, I can't go anywhere. I said, the club's open till two. I said, I can come down maybe then. And he said, no, it's too late. He said, I want you to come now. I said, I'm not going. He said, well, I'll be forced to take you. I said, well, feel forced. He said, because I ain't going. <laughs> and he went, oh, and he went away and he got on the radio. He went, all right. He said, how about if you come down, what day's good for you? <laughs> right? Quality. So I went, yeah. Like, I said, I'll come like down Thursday. <laughs> right? So I said, I said, I'd come down Thursday and I didn't go. Yeah. I just didn't get, didn't turn up again. So then they turned up my house again. Miss said the same. This went on for months. Nine months this went on for. Not, not a couple of weeks. Mm. Nine months this went on, this cat and mouse with mm. the police, right? Finally, I'm standing on the door. That thought is, I think it might have been a Sunday night. So we shut early anyway. And this police van's going up and down thing. And they kept looking at me, out of the, kept looking at me, staring at me out the window. So I thought, anyway, all of a sudden it's pulled up and it's all these riot squads got out. And they've got shields and batons. There's like eight, ten of them. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> I and mean, he went, Marcus Redwood. I went, yeah, you know it's me. He went, come with us. <laughs> I went, okay. okay. I said, um, I'm quite flattered. Yeah. I said, like, you bought this many? He said, I said, I'll tell you what, I said, I, I will come with you. I said, I'm not putting handcuffs on and I want to be out in an hour. He went, oh, I can't promise that. I said, I ain't going then. I'm not going peacefully. I said, you're going to have to earn your money. He said, you're kidding me. He said, look, there's, there's like, you know, 10 of us, whatever. He said, he said you know, we're going to, I said, I know you are. I said, but I, I, I said, listen, I want to be out in an hour. I said, you know, I said, no, it's over. I said, the arsehole tried to my wife. I said, I give him a smack. I said, I'll tell you that now. I smacked him. Yeah. So what? Right? Anyway, so uh, I ended up, they, they didn't handcuff me. They took me down there. They photographed me, fingerprinted me, and I was out in 50 minutes. Brilliant. Right? <laughs> so I was, I was honestly, it, it was crazy. You would not be able to do that now. You would mm. not be able to tell the police what mm. you want and get it. But anyway, I got released and it was quite funny. It did go to court, but it was like, it was nine months old by the time they even charged me. It was then... 23 months old by the time it went to Crown Court. So it was almost two years. And by this time, this guy has now really had time to think about what he did. <clears throat> and uh, he, I mean, it was a serious charge. It was, um, I think it was like a section 18 or something. So it was like, a, it wasn't, it was a, you know, sort with intent. Yeah. Um, but um, I had a very good friend who actually had a word with him. Yeah. Um, they sort of kind of kidnapped him. <laughs> And asked him if he still wanted to prosecute, and he really didn't. So anyway, so when it went to court, um, he was what they call a hostile witness. Yeah. So um, he got up in court and he said, "Look, you know, it's been nearly two years. I was totally out of order. It was all my fault. Me and Mark's are friends now, and I'd rather rather drop the charges." <laughs> and <he> went, ah. <laughs> so he got it. So I got thrown out. Result. Yeah, well, result for me, but obviously then another another thorn in the side for them. So another another little dislike. Yeah. So this, that, all this dislike has been building up. Building oh, that, up this, that was one of the early ones. Yeah. So that did, but it built up and built up because, like I said, lots of times they wanted, they wanted a case on me. I mean, I saved, I saved a whole family once from getting shot by gypsies. Um, again, I stepped in the middle of something. I know the police wouldn't agree with it, 
but I did what I did for the guy because I actually really liked this guy and his family and I knew they were going to get seriously hurt. And I knew the gypsies. I knew the family that were involved. And they'd shot people before who'd witnessed against them in court. They'd shot them on the steps of the courthouse. So uh, this was a family that had got, got involved in something. They, 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 they'd sort of been dragged into it. And I think it was the guy's sister had gone out with one of my doormen. Yeah. And that doorman had had something to do with the gypsies and caused a problem. Mm. And he owed them money. And they knew that his girlfriend's family had money, so they came to yeah. them and threatened them. He mistakenly phoned the police. The police actually arrested the gypsies. It was all going to go to court, and, and the gypsies were not happy about it. They'd been sort of banged the rights if this family would actually prosecute. Mm. <clears throat> but my, the guy didn't really want to prosecute. I went to see him, and I, I, when I heard about it, I said, look, I said, what do you actually want? I said, if you want to prosecute, go ahead and prosecute. I said, but I know these guys are planning to shoot you or your family, and they will. All right? I said, it's a serious shit. He said, I just want to be left alone. He said, I just want things to go back the way they were. Mm. He said, uh, he said, the police said they're going to protect me. I went, yeah, for a day. And then you'll be out and they're, they're going to come and find you. Yeah. I, I know these people. I said, look, he said, what do you suggest? I said, I suggest you all go missing. Right. I said, I will go to the gypsies and speak to the gypsies and I will ask them. I'll tell them. I'll make a deal with them. There's going to be no witnesses at court. Mm. Right. But they've got to give them. And I'd, I'd, I already had some of them on my side anyway. I said, but they're, they're going to give me their word that they are not going to ever, ever bother you or your family again, mm. all right? And, and he went, I'm happy with that. I mean, it's a deal. So that's what happened. So no one ever really knew about this. This was very hushed, hushed mm. at the time, but it's a long time ago now. But that guy, I, actually, I spoke to him the other day. His name's Toby. He lives in America now. <laughs> and none of his family got shot, thank God. Yeah. And none of the gypsies went to prison. Did so, they get their money? No. They didn't? No, I, okay. told him, I told him they had to leave that. Okay. I told him that was part of the deal because mm. he, he didn't owe him anything. They just wanted to leave. They wanted to leverage him because of you know. And put the squeeze on him. Yeah, put the squeeze yeah, on him because okay. they knew he, he was a. This guy was a millionaire by the time he was twenty-one. Yeah, he was an amazing guy, mm. really lovely guy, um, very very clever, um, but he wasn't a tough guy. Yeah, and I felt really sorry for him because he was out of his league, but yeah, so I rescued him. But uh, again, I don't know if the police knew about it or not, but it probably wouldn't have been too happy about that one. <laughs> what about this Paul fella? We call him Paul. Is he still? Have you seen him? Uh, he's obviously much older now. I mean, I was yeah. 23 then. You know, he's probably like he's probably got a cane now. Yeah, if he's still around. Um, but yeah, I, I've seen him in later years. But I mean, he never, never, he never done come near me. And after that, there was no. Mm. Again, that was that was in my early days. I was still sort of. I suppose I was still sort of making that reputation, yeah. if you like. But I didn't do that for reputation. I did it because he tried to my wife. Yeah. You know, that's in my book. That, that deserves a smack mm. in the chops. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And what about you personally? Over the last 40 years, you're working on doors, Marcus. In your 30s and 40s and 50s. How much did you calm down over the years? But you... it's it's been a sort of gradual. It's yeah. a gradual process. I mean, I would say that I'm I'm a totally different person now to where I was um, compared to what. Well, like when I was a young when I was a young doorman and I was training and I was and I was also using a lot of steroids. Yeah. And at the time, I think anyone who's taking steroids, I actually I do think I actually handled them really well. Mm. But I also know that they did make a difference to my rage level, and they certainly made a difference to my strength and my rage. Everything. I mean. I remember going out with Lloyd one night, just just going out for a night out and getting pissed, right? And I wasn't angry with anyone, but we were walking home and I I, I ripped two concrete bus stops out of the ground because um, I could. Mm. Just <laughs> snapped them off and threw them. Um, I picked up the end of a skip. I rolled over a car. Um, we used to, I used to be able to do that. Shit, yeah. You know, I mean, me and Lloyd for a laugh, we used to drink at this pub. We used to go down, pick a, we should pick a car up, drag it down the car park and stick the wheels over a wall at about three foot high. <laughs> Just to see the guys, just, just to can. see someone's face when they come out, you know. I mean, when I think back now, it was really naughty. Yeah, you know? it, was, it wasn't. It wasn't really the. Uh, but you know, if, if you're a bit pissed and you're, you've got a funny sense of humour, yeah. I suppose. You know, I picked up a big motorbike once and put it on top of a wall, so it was like balancing the walls like that, and the motorbikes like that. <laughs> <laughs> the guys like, oh, fuck it down. you know. Yeah. So the difference between Marcus sixty one today to Marcus in his fifties, what's the difference there? Yeah, I was still, like I said, the, the last, I think up until 50, I was still pretty strong at 50. But I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I mean, listen, if I went up against a 60 year old, I think I'll do pretty yeah, well at the moment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but you're not as strong or as quick or as whatever. But the, the only thing you do have is a lot of experience. Mm. So there's a lot of, there's a, what I did start to do, my first sort of 10, 20 years on the door, I was fighting. Mm. I was full out fighting. I was a boxer. I was, I was, I was someone who did boxing. I wouldn't say I was a boxer, but I was someone who had boxing training and I was very strong now because mm. of the gym and the size of me. So 
but like I said, I started breaking people, and, and every time I hit someone, I'd get nicked. You know, it's like yeah. GBH again, GBH again. You know, I remember one year getting three GBHs in one year, and I thought, if it's, if I keep doing this, I'm going to prison. Yeah. You know, sooner or later, I'm going to punch someone so hard they're going to just drop dead, right? Or I'm going to be unlucky in the courtroom. You know, I mean, luckily most of these people had started the problem. You know, so I was I was able able to sort of not go to prison or get away with it because I was acting in some sort of self defence, even though they got badly hurt. But but what I did was I started learning Aikido. That mm. was in my, I think I was about 40 then when I started mm. learning Aikido. So it gave me a load of more, a load more skills I could use. So I could lock people up easier. I could put someone to sleep with a, you know, a, a quick a sleeper or a chokehold um, and without damaging them. So yeah. if you put someone to sleep, which I got really good at that. I mean, I got, I was like a master at it. I could just grab you with one hand and I'd have you out in four seconds. You'd be unconscious. Straight away. Straight away. Four. And how long would you be? And and would that make you go? You know what? That's dealt with. Not a problem. We will wake up in a minute. Well, I could just I could just literally drag him out to the drag him outside the door then and just sit him outside the door and slap 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 wake up. <laughs> you know, and the guy goes, <laughs> you know. So what? So how would you do it to me now? It's real simple. You got you got veins up here that go to your that supply the blood to your brain. Yeah. You can actually do this to yourself and you'll feel it happen. Yeah. So if you if you make make a V with your hand. Yeah. And you push in. Yeah. And then you push up. up Oh, yeah. Push up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? And you'll feel the pressure in yeah. your head. Well, do that Do that a bit harder mm. and squeeze a bit more. Push that up and just go in and up and do that for a few seconds. And the blood is shut off in about four seconds. They go... Poof. Now, they've got... Most people have got... They're in a panic, most people anyway, so they're uh, like that. But most, as, as good ones get off maybe one or two shots. Mm. I've had a couple of smacks in the face, but I just kept hold of them. And then they just go... Poof, drop. So there's no, I haven't broken anything. Mm. As long as you let go, if you was to keep that on, you'd, you'd do brain damage, you'd kill him. Right, okay. Right, so it's it's not something I am encouraging people to yeah. do. I was shown how to do it, and I because I got had so many opportunities to try it, I got really good at it. And was that an easier way for you to deal with problems at that oh, time? Oh, yeah. I mean, look, you can get a massive guy who can really, like, you, you might struggle with two or three doormen to get him out. Yeah. But I could just put him unconscious. Yeah. And he's done. <laughs> and when he comes round... He's not going to feel like fighting anyway. Yeah. Well, imagine, imagine like, imagine your last memory. You're in a bar. Yeah. Someone goes. Yeah. The next thing you know, you're in a car park. Yeah. And he goes, oh, hang on. What's happened there? <laughs> you know, you, you, and you're outside now. So you've got to fight. To, you've got to fight to get back in. Mm. So what's the point? You know, most people they feel so groggy when they come around. They're like, oh. Ooh. Is there ever been a moment in your life, Marcus, where you've gone? I think I'm close to dying here. Ah. Uh... Um, what through what through the fights, the injuries, the shooting? Just, just anything that you've gone through. You go, you know what? I've had a I've had a near miss here. I didn't think my own friends were taking bets. I wouldn't make thirty. Is that right? Yeah, my own good friends were actually like, he ain't gonna make thirty. Yeah, yeah, he's gonna get. He's just gonna get shot dead. Yeah, because I was getting in. I was getting into. I didn't run away from anything. So yeah, normally ran towards it. Mm. Uh, I, I think I just had a lot of luck. I think a lot of luck, a lot of balls. Um, because it wasn't, when I look back now, Jesus, I mean, I, I don't think I'd make the same decisions yeah. now. Yeah. You know, I think with an older head, you think you'd, you'd be weighing up things. Oh, that's probably not a good idea. Mm. But I would just do it, you know, and it was, but it was that spontaneity that probably actually won the day, if you like, mm. and got me through it. But yeah, there was, there was a time there where, and I wasn't really bothered about it. That's the truth of it. I was well, like, you didn't have the fear of death dying. No, I didn't really. Okay. I was like, I mean, yeah, no one wants to get shot at. No one wants. I think the, it did cause a lot of anxiety when you know you've got, when you know you've got a hit out on you. I mean, I had another one. The, the police one day contacted me. This is when they were in the same sort of era of when they were raiding me. And always, they rung me up one day to CID. And I went, oh, what have I done now? You know, he said, oh, I want you to come down to the police station. And I said, okay, what, what, do I need to bring a solicitor? They were like, no, no, just, just come down. We need to talk to you. So I went, I went down there and um, I said, well, you know, they showed me into this back room and shut the door. It was all very, I thought, oh shit, what's going on? He said, look, he said, where are you working Friday? I said, uh, escape nightclub. He said, we've heard you're going to get killed on Friday. You're going to get shot dead on Friday. Someone's paid five grand to have you shot dead. I said, what are you going to do about it? He went, well, nothing. He said, before we let it, better let you know. <laughs> right? I went, oh, hang on a minute. I went, ah, you know, well, tell me more then. Yeah. I said, you know, he said, well, there's not much we can do about it. He said, well, we know this guy's paid five grand. I went, well, who is he? Mm. You know, what's his name? Give me a clue. Because mm. I got no idea. Anyway, so they said, um, they gave me his name. I can't remember it. They gave me a name. They said he lived in Whitstable, which is like 21 miles away from where I live. So I thought, right, okay, so I thought, I better take the night off then. So I took the night off work, got one of my big lumpy dormant, my mates, and we went searching for him. And we, so we found him. We found his house. 
we asked around a few pubs and places where we found this guy's house. So I brought Mark's up to his front door and I had these little gold business cards in with my, Mark one security. Mm. So I just rang his doorbell and he opened the door and went, all right, I said, I'm Markless. I said, I understand you paid five grand to have me shot. I went, here's my card. <laughs> I went, listen, I said, I really don't want to get shot. I said, but I don't even know what it's about. I said, but I'm just here to tell you. I said, if you do decide to go ahead with it and shoot me dead, I said, all of my firm, Mark one security, and now I'm going to know exactly where you live. I said, they're not going to be very happy about not having a boss anymore. I went, and at that time, there was about 50 of them. Yeah. I went, so there's 50 people who are going to be really pissed off at you. I'll see you later. And they just fucked off. And he was like, <laughs> anyway, needless yeah. to say, no one, no one tried to shoot at me that time. It sort of stopped. And it turns out, the reason behind it wasn't even me that should have got shot. Mm. I had some doors in Whitstable, and one of his mates got beaten up by some doorman from another door which weren't my doorman. Mm. And he was doing it because they, oh, that's that Marcus, it's him. So I got the blame for that. Mm. And it wasn't me and it wasn't my doorman. Do you think that Ag has followed you about all around your life? Yeah. Like yeah. Even when you go, even when we're chatting about Thailand and stuff, like Thailand for you is your sort of haven, it was, it haven, to, get, haven. Your haven to get away. And we <laughs> chat many a times, getting to go, oh, Dodge, I'm out there, this is nice, easy. But Ag still followed you out there. It always seems to find me. Why is it find you? Because you're not, as you're in your latter years, you've, you, you, mate, your late 40s, your 50s, and the person I know now, mm. I can't understand why it's still following you I about. I think part of it was because I don't like, I, I don't like rude people or bullies. Yeah. You know, and, and when you're out in, I think some of the stuff I, some of the stuff I encountered out in Thailand, some of it was like people, people, when you're, when you're quite big or covered in tattoos or you look a bit, you look a bit, Hard or yeah. tough, or whatever. Yeah. You're to some people, you're a target. Yeah. I mean, I don't. I honestly don't. I'm not big headed. I'm not like. I, I don't think of myself as like. Oh, look at me! I'm really super yeah. duper. Yeah. Obviously, I try and keep myself in shape and all yeah. that. But I'll give you an example. I was in a bar. I had a really good night out. I was in this bar, and it's a really late night bar. Everyone says don't go there because there's loads of fights. It was called JP Bar. Everyone, anyone who's been to Patea will know JP Bar. It's not now. They've now built a nightclub over it. But in them days, it was a little bar. It was open till it opens late and it opens till well, like midday the next day. And it's got pool tables in it. It's an open bar. So there's no walls really. It's like an open bar with pool tables. But everyone comes out of the nightclubs on Walking Street and they go, they sort of wander in there for a last, last. it's a last mm. chance to grab a bird. Yeah, the right? old tent to two. Yeah, yeah, sort of. Right? It's like <laughs> tent to six. Tent to six, know? yeah. Anyway, but it's also, everyone's off their nuts. So it's, yeah. it's a, it could be a rough place. So I was in there. I'd been out all night with my mates and I'd had a good time. Um, I was with two or three buddies, and uh, anyway, there was this. I, I was, I was, I had, I had a drink in my hand, and I'm chatting to my mates, and all of a sudden, someone's barged into me really hard, and my drink's gone flying. But the person, instead of saying sorry, it's a great big fella, and he's just bowled onto the toilets. And I went to react to my mates, went, no, nah, leave it. It's like, I think it was 4 a.m. Mm. My mate went, no, it's 4 a.m. He said, everyone's had a drink. He went, no, nah, leave it. He said, it's probably just, just a mistake, mm. you know? So, all right, so I went and got another drink, and I'm forgetting it. I'm chatting with my mates again, still standing there. He's just come back. I haven't, I haven't even clocked him coming back. I was like, just so busy chatting, mate. Bosh, done it again, right? And I thought, twice is not an accident, mm -hmm. right? So I've just, I've looked, I've put my glass down, I've just followed this guy and he doesn't know I'm following him. I, he's walked back to his mates and he's got back to his mates and he went, see that big cat with a chain? He goes, I've just fucking done mm -hmm. that. I've just given that to him and he's like, he thinks he's really flash. I went, wait, you've got something to say. I'm right here. Huh. He went, uh, he's wanker, he went, right, right, you're a wanker or something like that. I was like, oh, I'll be him with a massive elbow straight around his jaw. But he's just unconscious while he was standing, basically. <laughs> he's just gone spank and he's just cracked his head open. And his two mates have gone to jump off their bar stools. I went, yeah, you want it as well? Mm. And they're like, no, 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 we just want to pick our friend up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, so they picked him up and all my mates are going, oh, calm down, calm down. Mm. I said, no, I'm all calm, I'm calm, I'm all right. But I said, I was like totally unprovoked. What did mm. I do? Why did I deserve that? Mm. Right. So anyway, anyway, 10 minutes later, he's finally woken up and got mm. to his feet about 10, 15 minutes later. And they've walked him over. He can't even walk still, right? They've literally holding him up. And he's going, I said, what do you want now? He goes, I just want to apologise. Oh, like, oh, mate, I said, why did why? you do it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, I was minding my own business. Mm. I said, I never pulled a face at you or stared at mm. you or nothing. I said, I'm having a chat. I said, you've done it twice. Mm. And then you called me a wanker to my face. Mm. You know, I don't. That was just a typical. That's that, that's the sort of thing that happened to me. Do you find that? Do you find that happens to you everywhere you go? No, not everywhere, but it. Because I can't see that the person you are today, like when we're out, the, the, the most polite, humble, nice, I, I kind, and that's what you are. But still, it's still it's still sort of 
attracts, it still sort of comes to you. This, this, I don't, sometimes I'll I'm trying deal to get my head around that. Yeah, bit. sometimes I'll deal with it with humour instead. You yeah. know? I mean, if someone says that they try to insult me or something, you know, like I say, uh, you know, I say, like, I say no, opinions are like arseholes, everyone's got one. Yeah. You know, I, I try and find a witty response yeah. to diffuse it. But sometimes some things just can't. You know, when, mm. it's, when it gets physical, where someone's actually like barging into yeah. you or whatever, you know, then it, you know, it's. I like, like that. You know. <laughs> yeah, I had one with a Danish guy, massive Danish guy, huge. Yours, Where were you? In Thailand. Yeah. And he wouldn't, and that was just after I broke up with my second wife mm. and I wasn't in a good place mentally. Mm. And I'd been off the steroids for like five years and I just, I just decided to- How old to, roughly? Oh, I would have been 47. Okay. So I'm 47. I was, um, I was, I was not happy about the, the breakup. Um, she just, she just up and left and buggered off to Australia. Um, and I was, I was actually really, I was really upset over it. I thought I'd married someone. I thought that was going to be mm. it, you know? So I, so my head was a bit, my head was up my ass with the time. I went, I reverted back to my old self a little bit and I started back on loads of steroids. I started doing more drugs. So I'm in, and I'm in there trying to blow off steam. I'd, I'd met up with a couple of real lunatics from like Patea area that I knew. I hadn't seen them for a while. So we're in this bar, we're chatting. We'd, we'd, it was like a bench seat. It was like, so this is the table. There was a seat here, but it was a mm. bench. You had to sort of slide mm. behind yeah, it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sitting here, my mates are there, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm chatting away. I've got my back to that way. And all of a sudden, I got a tap on the shoulder. Great big fella. And he's like, he said, where are you from? I was like, England. And he goes, oh, I'm from Denmark. I'm like, oh, good for you. So I turned around and started talking to my friends again. Mm. Tap, tap, tap. I said, what? He said, we conquered your country. I said, when? What are you on about? I said, well, you didn't conquer your fat <laughs> <laughs> I went, is that what you said? Oh, yeah, you didn't conquer your back. <laughs> I went, what are you on about? He goes, we conquered your country. And, uh, and he says, he's talking about like when the Danes yeah. invaded England, yeah. I think, you know, it's been quite a long, long mm. forgotten. So I said, look, mate, I said, will you please do me a favor? I said, I haven't seen these guys for like, you know, a few months. I'm just trying to catch up with my friends. Mm. I said, can you just leave me alone? And he had a bird with him, you know, mm. so I was like, you know, leave me alone. And I was very polite. So I, I turned around again, then he tapped me on the shoulder again. He said, well, why are you not, why are you not looking at the women? I said, mate, I said, please. I said, look, if you keep bothering me, I said, you see that? I said, I'm going to put that right there. All right? I said, now leave me alone. So I'm a bit more stern this time. Yeah. Right. I thought, well, let's, let's do it. So I turned around. I chatted with him, mate, and I got this tap, tap, tap again. I thought, oh. I said to him, I think it's about time we move bars. Bang. <laughs> and I hit him so hard with an elbow. He's like, he just collapsed on the table. And the birds with him going, what have we done? What have we done? I went, he was annoying. <laughs> so I went to slide out the bar, slide out the seat and go. We just left him there unconscious on the table. But yeah, probably if I wasn't in a bad mood like yeah. I was in, I probably wouldn't have reacted that way, but he just wouldn't let it go. So when you were that 47, your wife left you mm. and you were hitting drugs, you were hitting more roids and stuff, mm. did you sink into proper depression? Probably did. Yeah. Yeah, I probably did. It took me, um, but, but Thailand was a good place to get undepressed. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was, I, I, listen, I, I, I'll be totally honest with you. You know, I, the first time I, the first time I had to travel there, um, on my own to Thailand because what it was I'd, I'd met I'd met that this girl Lana her name was I'd met her before I had the Thailand thing going on. Mm. We did like we did the Anthony Robbins seminars together. Yeah. We you know we worked together running Mark One and um, I started bought a first house together in Thailand. When I say together, I was I was paying for it all, but mm. it was we were together. Mm. So we built all this. I was building this sort of empire over there. I was buying up houses and properties, and then seven years into that, she left me. Why? Um, I, I don't really know the, the actual reason. I think she said, in actual fact, I originally thought it was because she couldn't, we couldn't have children because yeah. I told her I couldn't have kids because mm. all the steroid I'd taken mm. over the years, I didn't think I could have kids. And she said she didn't want kids. And then, and then all of a sudden, after you get married, all of a sudden it's like, oh, no, I really want kids. Yeah. So I tried. That's why I stopped taking steroids for five years. And I had all this fertility treatment. I'd done everything I could. But um, we still couldn't have kids. A couple of times we thought we got, you know, we thought we got pregnant, but it didn't turn out. It was, it was, it was like a phantom pregnancy. Anyway, um, in the end, uh, like I said, she, she just sort of left. And, and I never really knew what the answer was. Mm. I blamed it on that. But I bumped into her a couple of years later in Bromley. I was going through Bromley and I just give her a call and I met up and had a coffee with her. And I was still, I was still hurting. Mm. And I said, what, I don't know, why, why did you leave me? She said, well, she said, when you lost those contracts, well, that was in 2009. Yeah. When you lost those big contracts, I thought we were going to have to live like normal people. Is that what she did? I went, what? Well, yeah. I thought you left me because you couldn't have a kid. Mm. So you left me over money. Mm. She went, well, yeah. I said, well, I'm glad you told me that. Yeah. I said, because now that's a whole different, uh, now my feelings now are like, I'm glad she left. Mm. 
I'm glad if that's all it was. So, you know, by that time, I'd managed to build my business back up because mm. we did have a real big depression in 2009. Yeah. Um, but I, I built the business back up. My son was running it with me. Um, I had, you know, a nice motor. I had a few quid. So I was all back on top. And I thought, yeah, I'm glad you did go. Mm. And as it happens, I end up meeting someone a few years later who's, you know, lovely and I'm still with 11 yeah. years later. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Marcus, this has been a brilliant episode. Again. Again. Again, part three. Are we still? We're not going to do that, is it? Mate, <laughs> this is like part three, mate. This is, um, the stories are amazing. Uh. Absolutely amazing. I think we should ask... <laughs> Ask the, the people leave in the comments if they want a part four. Yeah. And you know what I was thinking as well? We're next year, we're thinking of doing an eventful lives like tour. tour. We're thinking of doing a tour yeah. where I can bring, I'll host it on stage, Dodge host, yeah. eventful lives on stage, and we bring in different characters. I think that'd be awesome. I think it would be, I think it I think would it'd be, be great. Very entertaining. I think it'd be really entertaining. Imagine yeah. like yourself mixed with like a Phil Campion. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. an SAS top man. We're or, friends on Facebook now. Yeah, your friends. Are, <laughs> and again, we, we should do that as a freeway episode coming when you're yeah. back off holiday and stuff. No, that but sounds great. I think it'd be a blinder. Yeah. Go and get a theatre somewhere, rent we it out. We still haven't, we still haven't got anywhere near. I know, I'm sure there's, well, I know there's loads there's more loads stories. Of, yeah. But let's ask, let's, let's leave, let people. Leave it to the public. Let's leave it yeah. to the public. If they want a part four, they can leave the comment below. But Mark, I really appreciate you yeah. coming down. I love it. I enjoy it every time. And I'm really glad that everyone out there seems to enjoy the stories as well. Yeah. Because it's, it's nice to get them off my chest. <laughs> well, it is. It's, it's, it's evergreen for you. Yeah. You know, yeah. what I like about doing this ep uh, podcast is that it's people there. are telling stories. And what I like about it, and I think why it's doing so well, is because it's cards on the table. Yeah. It is, honestly. Yeah. Yes. I hope the police are not tapped in. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's too late, mate. <laughs> A bit late, yeah. Marcus, you're a gentleman. Lovely. Thank you. Good man. Take it easy, mate. Cheers. Mate. Cheers.